Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. ABC News presents Footsteps on the Moon, the flight of Apollo 11. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Frank Reynolds at ABC Space Headquarters in New York. It is July 16th, 1969, and we are all about to witness the fulfillment of that promise that President Kennedy made at Rice University Stadium in Texas on September 12th, 1962. The moon that still has not set in some parts of our world has only a few more days of uh, what you might call untrammeled history. These three men are about to embark on certainly one of history's most glorious adventures. Commander Neil Armstrong, Lunar Module Pilot Buzz Aldrin, and Command Module Pilot Mike Collins. Armstrong and Collins have already entered their command module, and Buzz Aldrin will be entering to join them in a few moments to begin this epic journey. And we shall all see it. ABC Science Editor Jules Bergman is at the Cape. There has been uh, a minor difficulty uh, developed there at the Cape, and let's get a report from Jules now on just what is being done. Good morning, Jules. Good morning, Frank. We're at T-minus uh, two hours and 28 minutes into the scheduled launch of Apollo 11 at 9.32 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and the countdown has been going spectacularly until about 10 minutes ago, just before Neil Armstrong, Mike Collins, and Buzz Aldrin started to get in, into the cabin of Apollo 11. And then a slight leak developed in a valve system that replenishes the liquid hydrogen for the third stage of the Saturn V, the S-4B stage. The valve in question is not on the spacecraft itself, but on GSE, or ground support equipment. It's the same valve, the very same valve, by the way, that leaked back on Apollo 10. Everything else here, Frank, is holding up very well. There's a forecast of clouds at 15,000 feet. As we look back to pad 39, right directly behind our ABC News space headquarters here at the Cape, you can see the clouds over the ocean. They haven't yet truly developed over the land area, and if it stays this way, everyone in the country and millions of people gathered around central Florida will get a spectacular eyewitness view of Apollo 11 and the Saturn V lifting off. Uh, as it is now, there's a light layer of cirrus clouds that are about 15 to 20,000 feet over the Cape. Uh, they could cause some interference with visual viewing, but not with the launch itself. The launch limits have gone down really much, if you will, on this uh, fifth launch, fourth launch, we should say, of the Saturn V, fourth manned launch, fifth unmanned. Uh, as of now, the weather is good, the countdown going well, except for this liquid hydrogen leak, which has to be fixed, and there's no reason to think we won't lift off at 9.32 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, as scheduled. That's the story, Frank. The astronauts of Apollo 11 uh, awoke early today and began their ritual-like preparations for this blast off to the moon. Uh, one of their doctors, as I told you earlier, said they appear rested, fit as a fiddle, and ready to go. They actually had about eight hours of sound sleep, which is probably more than a good many other people who were preparing for this launch uh, today. They had a, a big breakfast of scrambled eggs, steak, toast, coffee, and orange juice. And for a film report on their final meal on Earth before blasting off, here's Jules Bergman at the Cape. Crew, <clears throat> astronauts Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins were awakened at 4.15 a.m. this morning, just about three hours ago, after having gone to bed about 9.20 last night, and immediately after a quick medical, uh, had a, a traditional astronaut's breakfast of steak and eggs. There's Buzz Aldrin, the lunar module pilot. We saw Mike Collins a moment ago. Spacecraft Commander Neil Armstrong, who'll be 39 on August 5th, just a few days from now, led by security guards, waving a farewell. As they get into the transfer van uh, for the three and a half mile ride uh, to pad 39A, Neil Armstrong leading the way, then Mike Collinson, and finally Buzz Aldrin. 
We're back at ABC Space Headquarters in New York, awaiting the still-scheduled launch at 9.32 Eastern Daylight Time this morning of Apollo 11. The commander of the mission is 38-year-old Neil Armstrong, the only civilian among the three-man crew, and, of course, the man scheduled to take the first actual step on the moon. The pilot of the lunar landing module is Edwin Aldrin, Jr., 39 years old, and an Air Force colonel. 38-year-old Michael Collins, a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, is the pilot of the command module. It will be his job to circle the moon while Armstrong and Aldrin are down on its surface. Jules, did you have any difficulty getting out to the Cape this morning? Frank, we had no difficulty, but we, we practically didn't get to sleep at all last <laughs> night, just to be sure we didn't have, or wouldn't have any difficulty. The shot we're looking at from the helicopter now is over Highway A1A, the main north-south road along the Atlantic, and we're looking at the beach just below the south gate, the old gate one of the Cape where we came in this morning. You know, the drama may be here at Pad 39 and on the moon this Sunday, that unforgettable drama, but it's somehow, for me, also on the roads around this spit of land, which Spanish explorers 352 years ago landed on and called Canaveral, for, for the fields of sugar cane. That's what Canaveral means in Spanish, cane fields. The fields of sugar cane they found growing here. We passed 10,000 odd cars, what we guesstimated, parked around the gate one area at 4 a.m. when we got here, cars from every state, with little kids staring wide-eyed at the Saturn V, glowing in the huge xenon spotlights 15 miles away and we saw teenagers with telescopes. It was the very same road we came over eight long years ago, 21 manned space flights ago, when we came out at it just about the same hour to cover Alan Shepard's 15-minute suborbital hop, America's first manned space flight. Americans cared then, I think, and they care now, and it was a very moving scene for me because, well, we were tired. They were tired, they'd been up all night. All those th thousands of people who we see now in daylight in those cars parked along the road that our live helicopter is uh, showing us. Indeed, the helicopter pilot this morning, Bob Lockrow is his name, was the same man who used to fly us here with the very first film switches we did on flights and the very first live things. There's good luck, good luck Apollo 11 engraved in the sand. All going very smoothly here with the count. Among the distinguished visitors here this morning, uh, along with Vice President Spiro Agnew, as the former president, Lyndon Johnson, there's our live picture from the VIP stands on the other side of the VAB and, and Launch Control Center. Behind uh, the former president is former NASA Administrator James Webb, sitting in the picture, uh, and many other dignitaries gathered there. Some 8,000 dignitaries and all invited by the space agency as guests uh, to be at this launch. And there's Mrs. Johnson being greeted with the former president. 42 minutes and 44 seconds away from liftoff now of Apollo 11, which is about the size of a United States Navy destroyer, as we pointed out to you uh, a bit earlier. It stands higher than the Statue of Liberty, and it is the most sophisticated space vehicle in the world today. It is made up of five separate parts. Jules Bergman has the story on it. Apollo 11 contains the lunar module, or LEM, which will weigh more than 32,000 pounds at launch time. The command module serves as a flight operations center and living quarters for the astronauts. After the third stage rocket sends Apollo 11 toward the moon, the onboard service module engine will be used to put the astronauts into lunar orbit and later to return them home to Earth. The total payload, nearly 100,000 pounds, rests on a Saturn V rocket. The first stage generates seven and a half million pounds of thrust at liftoff. The second stage will carry the Apollo spacecraft and astronauts to an altitude of 100 miles. And then the third stage breaks Apollo 11 out of Earth orbit and propels the astronauts toward the moon. And this is what Eagle, the lunar module uh, on Apollo 11, will look like after, uh, after its legs or uh, its, its gear is put down after translunar flight has begun and as it heads toward the moon. In addition to this black and white covering, of course, it's covered by gold and black uh, thermal foil, if you will, mylar foil and black foil to protect it from heating as it heads around into lunar orbit and then down, down toward its descent on the moon. But essentially, that's what the vehicle looks like, a very ungainly machine. The astronauts still call it a thin light-walled flying machine, a thin light-walled structure, but it has proven to be one heck of a good flying machine on two flights now, Apollo 9 and Apollo 10. 
launch control is telling us now that uh, things are proceeding very smoothly with the fueling and with topping off the liquid oxygen in the S1C, the Saturn uh, main stage, all going very smoothly at uh, T minus 40 minutes. And uh, we're lifting off at 9.32 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time as of now, everything proceeding very smoothly toward that pre-calculated liftoff time. Two minutes, 10 seconds and counting. The target for the Apollo 11 astronauts, the moon at liftoff will be at a distance of 218,096 miles away. We've just passed the two minute mark in the countdown. T minus one minute, 54 seconds and counting. Our status board indicates that the oxidizer tanks in the second and third stages now have pressurized. We continue to build up pressure in all three stages uh, here at the last minute uh, to prepare it for liftoff. T minus one minute, 35 seconds on the Apollo mission, the flight to land of the first men on the moon. All indications uh, coming in uh, to the control center at this time indicate we are go. One minute, 25 seconds and counting. Our status board indicates the third stage completely pressurized. 80 second mark has now been passed. We'll go on full internal power at the 50 second mark in the countdown. Guidance system goes on internal at 17 seconds, leading up to the ignition sequence at 8.9 seconds. We're approaching the 60 second mark on the Apollo 11 mission. T minus 60 seconds and counting. We pass T minus 60. 55 seconds and counting. Neil Armstrong just reported back. It's been a real smooth countdown. We passed the 50 second mark. Power transfer is complete. We're on internal power with the launch vehicle at this time. 40 seconds away from the Apollo 11 liftoff. All the second stage tanks now pressurized. 35 seconds and counting. We are still go with Apollo 11. 30 seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on a bottle run. Inboard engines out. I'm inboard, got him. 
in board cut off exactly on schedule. Apollo 11 now 3,000 miles, do, now doing 3,650 miles an hour. Eight. Downrange 35 miles, 30 miles high. Standing by for the outboard engine cut down now. Armstrong reporting staging and ignition. The first stage engines have burned out exactly on schedule. The second stage engines have lit off. Houston thrusters go. All engines, you're looking good. All right, Richard, you're loud and clear, Houston. 41 three miles. Three minutes downrange, 70 miles. 43 miles high, velocity 9,300 feet per second. We got skirt step. Roger, we confirm skirt step. Apollo 11 going a little faster than expected, but perfect, perfectly within limits. Neil Armstrong confirming both the engine skirt separation and the launch escape tower separation. Houston, be advised the visual is go today. This is Houston, roger out. Yeah, they finally gave me a window to look out. Eleven Houston, uh, your guidance has converged, you're looking good. Downrange 140 miles, altitude 62 miles, velocity 10,300 feet per second. 11 Houston, you are a go at four minutes. Gotcha. Still in sight from our long range cameras. Track. Burning hot, straight and true all the way. Toward a moon 218,000 miles distant. A moment many Americans, many people never believed could happen or would happen. 190 miles downrange now, 72 miles high, velocity 11,000 feet per second. And the first major hurdles have been passed for Apollo 11. All going very, very well. The first minutes of a 195 hour long flight ticking off almost without tension, almost like a regular airliner takeoff, but for the thunderous roar, the flame of the Saturn. Booster says it's looking good at five minutes. Well, then Houston, you are go at five minutes. Roger, you're all 11, go. We're hearing Neil Armstrong live, uh, reporting back to Booster control, Capcom in Down mission control. 70 miles, altitude 82 miles, velocity 12,400. 72 feet per second. Fly to S4B to COI capability. Okay. That's 9,000 miles an hour. S4B to COI capability. That's 9,000 miles an hour. Confirmation that the uh, Apollo 11 could now get into orbit using the S4B if necessary. You live in your living room. Oh, thank you. You all are coming through beautifully, too. Very clear communications this morning. Very clear air to ground from. Uh, Apollo 11, that's Capcom Bruce McCandless, you hear talking uh, from Houston Mission Control. And occasionally Flight Director Cliff Charlesworth uh, in the background. And down... Everyone's reporting go here in the control center. Oh, it's six minutes. Start to get my orders. And our long range... Roger 11, uh, your go from the ground at six minutes. Our long range cameras have lost the picture finally. We're at, our cameras are now at pad 39, viewing that water deluge or dousing system we told you about. Hundreds of thousands of gallons of water, saving the pad from being all but uh, wiped out by the heat and the flame. The water still going, still keeping cool. Our animated view uh, now showing us what's happening up there at uh, six minutes and uh, 35 seconds into the flight of Apollo 11. In between the second stage and the third stage, the fuel uncovers uh, a sensor starting that sequence. We're coming up uh, almost to the point where uh, the second stage S2 rockets will burn out. Covered at 8 minutes 17 seconds with outboard engine cut off 9 minutes 11 seconds on the second stage. Apollo 11 is good at 7 minutes. 11, this is Houston. Roger, your go from the ground at 7 minutes. Level sense arm at 8 plus 1, 7. Outboard cut off at 9 plus 1, 1. Roger. 
Very close Down to nominal figures. 30 miles, altitude 95 miles, velocity 17,358 feet per second. Apollo 11 has almost reached orbital velocity now. It'll require another minute of burn of the S2 second stage. President Johnson in the VIP stands with Lady Bird Johnson, obviously relaxed, happy at the way the launch went, and Vice President Agnew next to the president. Seven minutes, president. 41 seconds. Roger, we confirm. Inboard engines are out on the second stage as planned. Inboard engine burnout exactly on schedule at 7 minutes, 40 seconds. now about three minutes away from going into Earth's orbit over mid-Atlantic. Apollo 11, go on all sources. In your go at eight minutes. I've just built the mixture ratio ship. And galloping right, along. We got the ship down here too. Apollo 11 galloping along now at more than 12,500 miles an hour. was Neil Armstrong, we couldn't make out what he said. 11, this is Houston, you are go for staging, over. Houston, go for staging. Stand by for mode four capability. Mode four. Mark, mode four capability. Mode four and Apollo 11 could get into orbit using the service propulsion system now. Altitude is 100 miles, downrange 883 miles. Outboard engine cut off. And ignition. Ignition confirmed. Thrust is go, 11. And we have a good third stage now. Third stage ignition on schedule. Speed building up just the way it should. Looking very, very good. Velocity 23,128 feet per second. Downrange 1,000 miles, altitude 101 miles. Follow 11, this is Houston. At 10 minutes, you are go. All right, you're 11, go. Capcom Bruce McCandless giving the reports here from the control center. Relax, Neil Armstrong saying, ah, Roger, we are go. Apollo 11, this is Houston. Predicted cutoff at 1-1 plus 4-2, over. 1-1-4-2, Rich. Downrange 1,175 miles. Velocity 24,190 miles, feet per second. Altitude 102 nautical miles. still go on all sources. Apollo 11, this is Houston. You are go at 11. And taking away the last few seconds. We're predicting third stage shutdown at 11 minutes, 42 seconds. And Apollo 11 is just about ready to go into orbit in a few seconds from now. Velocity 25,254 feet per second. Downrange 1,400 miles now. Altitude uh, 102.8 nautical miles. Shut down. Shut down right on time. 101.4 by 103.6. Roger, shut down. We copy 101.4 by 103.6. And Apollo 11 is in orbit. Scratchy. Uh... Apollo 11, this is Houston. You are confirmed go for orbit. When the third stage is fired, the astronauts will then be inserted into an Earth parking orbit. 
The guidance system has already computed the trajectory needed to intercept the moon. The confirmation of that trajectory or course will be relayed by Houston to the astronauts. Two hours and 40 minutes after launch over the Pacific, the third stage engine will be restarted and when an escape velocity of nearly 25,000 miles per hour is reached, Apollo 11 will be injected into a translunar trajectory. Soon after, the panels of the spacecraft's lunar module adapter are jettisoned. The Apollo command and service module then separates from the booster. The astronauts start the docking maneuver, rotating Apollo 180 degrees, and then, using their small thruster rockets, dock with the LEM. The third stage will be jettisoned when the docking maneuver is completed about two hours after translunar injection. The astronauts, using star sightings backed up by mission control, guidance radar, and computers, then work up the data to make mid-course corrections and set their course to intercept the moon three days later. Depending on how accurate the rocket engine burns to get away from Earth, none or as many as three mid-course corrections may be needed. Apollo's speed decreases from 25,000 to less than 4,000 miles per hour en route. Then, near the moon as lunar gravity begins to exert its influence, the speed of the spacecraft increases up to 6,000 miles per hour. Apollo 11 is in a free return trajectory, which will carry it around the moon and back to Earth for recovery if problems have developed. But if all has gone well, Apollo 11's onboard service module engine will be fired and the spacecraft will be placed into lunar orbit. Because of the danger of mechanical failure, all of the systems can be overridden by the astronauts if the automatic systems aren't working perfectly. 81 hours into the flight, Armstrong and Aldrin transfer into the lunar module for the second time, completing their checkout of the lunar landing spacecraft. They remove the docking probe and drogue from the tunnel connecting the command and lunar modules and equalize the pressure in both vehicles. The lunar module pilot then floats through the docking tunnel overhead and into the LEM. One of the first tasks for the lunar module pilot is to activate the LEM's environmental control system and to change his suit connections to the LEM's umbilicals. Now, today, today the moon is the target, and we're going to get the word on that TLI burn coming up in just a moment now from Mr. Control. And we're now 14 seconds away from TLI burn. Mission Control is counting down. There's ignition. There's the word from Mission Control. Ignition over the South Pacific for the translunar insertion burn. We confirm ignition, and the thrust is go. The thrust is built up to get them headed up to uh, escape velocity speed of 25,000 miles an hour. The burn took place over the southwestern Pacific. Two hours and uh, 24 minutes into the flight of Apollo 11. It's looking good. Let's go to mission control now for the talk down to the separation maneuver. Copy. That's from the canvas saying he copied, but we very faint transmission. Let's see if we can pick it up. We can run the separation here on the ground. Separation confirmed. The third major hurdle of the flight accomplished. Next, that docking and extraction of the land. All right, we now have a picture from Apollo 11, so let's go to Houston for the conversation between the uh, spacecraft and Houston, and we'll see these pictures. There's the Earth. The Earth from 130,000 nautical or about 149,000 statute miles. Uh, do you think Earth, as uh, we see it, uh, on our left-hand window, just a little more than a half Earth, uh, we're looking at uh, the eastern Pacific Ocean, and the north half of the top half of the screen, uh, we can see uh, North America, Alaska, United States, Canada, Mexico, and Central America. South America becomes invisible just off beyond the Terminator or inside the shadow. We can see uh, the oceans with uh, a definite blue cast see white bands of major cloud formations across the earth and can see 
coastline that got uh, the western U.S., San Joaquin Valley, the Sierra Mountain Range, the peninsula of Baja, California, and can see some cloud formations over uh, southeastern U.S. There's one uh, definite uh, mild storm southwest of Alaska, looks like about uh, 500 to 1,000 miles, and another uh, very minor storm showing uh, the south end of the screen near the, uh, oh, a long way south of the equator, probably uh, 45 degrees or more south latitude. So you're saying, uh, Cliff Charles, where is that? Uh, we can still see the Earth uh, through the left window, and it appears that uh, we can see a floodlight uh, off to the left, either that or some sun shafting through the hatch window. Almost looks like two Earths. That's <laughs> floodlight. Uh, uh, now we're coming in. Uh, can't quite make out who that had. Big Mike Collins there. Well, you got a little bit of... Yeah, hello there, sports fans. You got a little bit of me, plus Neil's in the center couch, and Buzz is doing the camera work this time. Uh, Roger, uh, it's a uh, little dark uh, now, Levin. Uh, maybe a, a bigger F-stop might help. Yeah, that didn't work. <laughs> Mike, you coming in uh, five by, I got a good... Well, I put on a coat and tie, but I don't know about this ahead of time. Is uh, Buzz holding your cue cards for you over? <laughs> cue cards have a no. Uh, every second. 
Uh, we got 34-17-02 uh, now. Okay, back to the high gain angle. Uh, Roger. Swing amp. Now we've amputated those. quality picture we've ever seen from the inside of a spacecraft. It has to be able to read those numbers like that. It's like a tote board of the racetrack. Even if it is their uh, computer display keyboard or disk key readout. 11 uh, Houston, uh, it's, uh, we have a beautiful rainbow there and as you move the camera around, uh, I play, uh, that looks like the star chart coming into view now. Over. Yeah, those are both of two star charts that he uh, is using right now as sunshades over the uh, right-hand window, window number five. Uh, Roger, we see the sun shining in through it behind him and uh, plotting out the uh, uh, equator, uh, correction, the ecliptic plane and uh, the stars that you're using for the navigation. You're right. He doesn't really need the charts. He's got them memorized. They're just for show. Uh, we got the, well, we're uh, pointing up in this direction. We see out our side windows the sun going by, and of course, out one of our windows right now, we've got the earth. Now, right behind my window, where we have the sun, because the sun is illuminating the uh, star chart that we see. This line represents the ecliptic plane, and uh, these lines, vertical lines, represent our uh, reference system that uh, the spacecraft is using at this time. As we approach the moon, uh, the moon will gradually grow larger and larger in size, and eventually it will be in uh, eclipse. It will be eclipsing the uh, sun as we go behind it. As we approach the uh, lunar orbit insertion maneuver. Roger, 11. Uh, we've, uh, could you attempt a little bit better fo focus there, 11, over. Mike Collins is moving the camera around the inside of the spacecraft again, back to Buzz Aldrin's star charts. And then, uh, now Aldrin's the only one we haven't seen. He was talking just a moment ago, but we haven't seen him yet. So part of uh, the smooth pate of his uh, semi bald head. 11 Houston, uh, that's uh, a lot better on the star chart now. We can uh, make out the ecliptic plane and the, uh, the planets and the, the sun and the moon as, it, uh, as they're drawn at various places uh, throughout the ecliptic plane, over. Okay, Charlie. There's over. Slightly out of focus shot, a little audio breakup beginning, uh, if we can uh, get some of the wires untangled here, we'll uh, give you a demonstration of how easy push-ups are up here. I'm Roger. Ah, uh, get the view of Buzz there. these pictures of such good quality is they're using a small floodlight inside the cabin to help illuminate their faces and the instruments. And it gets pretty hard doing it that way, why we just roll over and do it the other way. Ah, uh, right, we copy. Couldn't figure out whether that was a chin-up or a push-up. Just take your choice, I guess. Aldrin going through a complete roll now in weightlessness. And floating his way forward in the cabin from the lower equipment bay. 
Here's a champion pole well, vaulter. Like it's probably almost your dinner time down there, Earth. We'll uh, show you our food cabinet here in a second. 11, Roger. You know, Frank, in weightlessness, even I could be a champion acrobat. It doesn't take a Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> Now we're looking in the left-hand lower equipment bay where the food is stored and prepared. It's probably Mike Collins. Well, in Houston, we see a box full of goodies there, over. Well, we really have them, Charlie. We've got all kinds of good stuff. We've got coffee up here in the upper left and uh, various uh, breakfast items, uh, bacon uh, in little small bites and uh, beverages like uh, fruit drink. And over in the center part, we have... Uh, Oh, all kinds of things. Let me pull one out here and see what it is. Right. Would you believe you're looking at uh, chicken stew here? All you have to do is three ounces of hot water for five or ten minutes. Now we get our our hot water out of a little spigot up here with a uh, a filter on it that that filters any gases that may be in the drinking water out and. Uh, we just stick the uh, the end of this little tube in the end of the spigot and uh, pull the trigger three times for three ounces of hot water and then mush it up and uh, slice the end off it. And there you go. Beautiful chicken stew. Sounds delicious. And that's their little emergency flashlight. Yeah, the food so far has been very good. Uh, we couldn't be happier with it. Roger. Flashlight a second. The surgeons are saying thank you there for that. And uh, it is sort of down in a dark corner, so uh, we have a flashlight here to, to help us uh, see things. And uh, if I can let go of it carefully, it'll uh, just hold itself right where it is. Ah, Roger. As long as you disturb it, will. You said it's a pretty good demonstration. You started off really stable there, Mike. Just, uh... Well, the problem is, no matter how carefully you let go, uh, you bump it just a tiny little bit, set it in motion, and uh, once in motion, there she goes. Try that again. Uh, it looks uh, fairly stable now with slow rotation. A little 13-pound portable TV camera shooting these pictures handheld by the astronauts themselves. Now more than 130,000 miles out in space. I sent their compliments to the chef this afternoon about the salmon salad. The chef made salmon fishermen well, very happy. Well, I'm going to the food department. I'm going to close up the store down here. Roger, we copy. Uh, Charlie, we checked out the cable lines, and uh, we're thinking we might want to uh, see if we can take the TV into the uh, uh, line with us tomorrow for uh, part of the time, over. Roger, good show. Uh, we'd like to see it if uh, it'll reach that far, over. We'll give it a try. Roger. And we're seeing Mike Collins closing up the food locker. That was Buzz Aldrin we heard saying they might take the camera up into the lunar module tomorrow at 56 hours into the flight when they check it out for the first time. Clear definition there, Colin's face. The camera has been clamped on using some small hand clamps they use for their still picture cameras and motion picture cameras. Now where I sleep is down underneath this couch. Houston, Roger. And Mike Collins is apparently about to show us a demonstration of his sleep state. Slowly sinking into the sack <laughs> there. <laughs> yeah, it's really comfortable. Good morning. Forgot to give Buzz his flashlight back. The 
they carry some seven of those little emergency flashlights, Frank, which are really meant as survival flashlights in case they come down on the water and are stranded at sea at night. But they end up using them for everything. Well, the one question that is raised most often, over and over again, talk about redundancy, is why go to the moon? Well, for scientists, of course, the answer is obvious. They feel that the unexplored moon, thus far unexplored, will tell us many things about our Earth that we cannot find out by studying the Earth itself. In making it a comfortable place to live here, we have more or less wiped out its early history. One of our guests throughout our Apollo 11 coverage, we've already heard from him today, is Dr. Robert Jastrow, who is director of the Goddard Institute for Space Studies at uh, Columbia University. We put the question to Dr. Goddard, why go to the moon? The moon is a poor piece of real estate, but, and probably lifeless. But for precisely that reason, it is scientifically invaluable. We would like to know what conditions were on the Earth in the first billion years of its history, about three and a half billion years ago, when life appeared on this planet according to the fossil record. We'd like to know how the solar system was formed and how the Earth itself was formed. These are things that we would like to know in order to understand whether we are probably unique in our human experience in this part of the world or this part of the universe, or uh, whether what we are experiencing on our planet has been gone through many times in many places. Now, unfortunately, this early history of the Earth has been wiped out by the very factors on our planet that make it such a comfortable place to live in. We have running water and we have winds, atmosphere. They erode all of the record of our past. We have mountain building, which creates the beautiful continents, but it also wears out and turns over and churns around the record or the rocks that were laid down here when the Earth was a young planet. The very life that we have has removed the traces of its own origins. On the moon, however, which we think is probably lifeless, there's no atmosphere, there's no running water at the present time, and we think that the record of its past is infinitely better preserved than it is on the Earth. Just looking at a picture of the moon such as this one shows you countless craters, the scars of meteorite impacts that have occurred throughout the moon's history. Uh, there are 100,000 of them or so visible in a telescope on the front face of the moon alone. Now these craters, which were probably formed by meteorite impacts, have also, uh, or must also, have occurred on the Earth. The same bombardment by meteorites must have occurred. Uh, there, there are, however, very few remains of those craters left. One of the few remaining is the Arizona crater, uh, a crater 4,000 feet across that you can see uh, when you fly, let's say, from New York to Los Angeles in a jet. Uh, this is one of 20 or so craters that are still visible on the face of the Earth. The other hundreds of thousands of millions have been worn away and turned over and buried. Because of the fact that these craters still remain on the moon, but are gone from the Earth, we are pretty confident that the moon surface goes back farther from the surface of the Earth. Uh, just as a digression, by the way, uh, I'd like to mention that there was a big dispute among uh, scientists until recently over whether the craters on the moon were volcanic or meteorite impact. I think most people believe that while some of these craters are volcanoes, the majority of them are meteorite impacts. And the reason they believe that can be demonstrated in the studio. A, uh, when a meteorite comes into the surface of the moon, it has so high a speed that its energy per pound is five or 10 times that of TNT. It drills a clean hole in the surface of the moon and uh, buries itself underground, driving a plug of moon rock ahead of it at such a great rate that the, pl the plug of rock is compressed and heated to a gas a vaporized rock gas. When the meteorite comes to rest, then uh, this plug of hot gas explodes, ejecting all the material above it and forming a crater, something like a bomb crater. Bomb craters have exactly the same size and shape as, of, as most uh, meteorite, most craters on the moon, and we think, therefore, that moon craters are bomb craters. I can't explode a bomb in the studio, but I have buried a firecracker in a uh, bin of sand to uh, produce a, a small crater of the kind you can see in surveyor photographs of the moon, and a crater which in minuscule form has the dimensions, the scaling, and the shape of, um, of lunar craters and bomb craters on the Earth. That was very satisfactory because it shows not only the 
characteristic conical shape of, of uh, many lunar craters, but it even shows uh, the lip that forms around them and uh, the bits of debris, in this case they're chunks of flour, uh, that litter the field, and it shows these rays, these radiating lines of light material by which uh, scientists always are able to recognize freshly formed new craters on the moon. In particular, uh, this little explosion crater looks just like large bomb craters and like most lunar craters. So I think there's no doubt what the origin of lunar craters, of many of them at least, is. That doesn't uh, exclude the fact that some craters are volcanic, but that's another story, that's a, another matter. Now, there's a very interesting uh, consequence of the, of the fact that many craters on the moon are explosion craters formed by meteorites. Uh, I have a picture of a 500-foot crater, uh, uh, in the, uh, which happens to be in the ocean of storms on the west limb of the moon. It's actually in the mouth of the face of the man on the moon when you look at him in the sky. And you see in this crater a uh, littering of the field of the ocean si surface around it with chunks of rock, some of them 10, some of them 20, 30 feet in diameter. Um, the significance is that when we land on the moon in each of our landings, although the exploration or the region explored is quite small, perhaps the size of a garden plot uh, in the first landings, we will probably find on that uh, uh, garden plot, a, an accumulation of debris, as shown in the next photograph, the surveyor photograph, taken of a region on the moon similar to the regions in which the landings are, take, are occurring. Uh, a, we will find an accumulation of debris, as you see in this picture of the moon surface, uh, representing rocks hurled out of craters all over the moon, rocks from all ages of the moon's past, all depths, all places. Uh, a, an excellent sample of the whole moon acquired from the exploration of one uh, small territory. At least we uh, will be finding these things, this variety, if, if we're lucky. What will we do with these samples of rocks when we get them? Well, the, the key question always, I think, in discussing the scientific interest of the moon is, does any part of its surface go back to the missing billion years of the solar system's history and the time in which life appeared on our own planet, or does it not? How old is the surface of the moon? There's much controversy on that question. Some of us hope or expect that parts of the moon do go back to that first missing billion years. And uh, partly with this motivation, among the experiments performed on the lunar rocks as soon as they are let out of quarantine in Houston, the single largest block, about 30 or 40 experimental groups here and abroad, will be concerned with dating these rocks. They're dated radioactively using the fact that all rocks on the Earth, and we're pretty sure on the Moon, contain trace amounts of radioactive substances such as uranium. They're present in very, very minute traces. I think a few parts per million. But nonetheless, enough so that the uh, radioactivity can be detected if one has a, a Geiger counter. I have one here. It's connected to a... Um, to a, an amplifier and a microphone so that it gives a visible click every time it's triggered by the passage of a, an energetic particle through it. You can hear it click once in a while as I speak because a cosmic ray has passed through it. I also have a piece of rock which contains not invisible amounts but in an invisibly small amount some radioactive uranium. And as I bring this rock up to the Geiger counter, the proof of the existence of that radioactivity in the rock is, proof, is, is in the fact that an absolute cascade of counts comes out of the counter, almost drowning my voice. This radioactivity itself is not the main point. It uh, is not the means used to date the rocks uh, directly. Uh, that's done in the following way. That whenever a radioactive uh, uranium atom decays, emitting one of the particles that we just heard being audibly uh, detected by the counter, uh, it is transformed into a new nucleus and eventually winds up as lead. If the rock is very old, most of the uranium in it has been converted to lead. And when you measure the ratio of uranium to lead by delicate chemical analyses, you find very little uranium and a lot of lead. If the rock is young, very little of the uranium has been converted. And when you measure this ratio, you find mostly uranium 
and, and very little lead. So the ratio of uranium to the lead it produces by decay measures the age of the rock. We hope when we make that measurement, our, our experimenters, that they will find some samples whose ages turn out to be three and a half billion years or more and supply us with information on the missing pages of the Earth's and the Moon's history. And that will be the greatest scientific prize that we can possibly capture from the lunar exploration. So the paradox of the Moon is that precisely because it is a poor piece of real estate and probably lifeless, uh, with little or no water, for that very reason, it is likely to have preserved the record of its past better than the Earth. And in those samples, we hope or, or uh, expect that we will find clues to the origin of the Earth, the origin of the solar system, perhaps even uh, the conditions under which life began on the Earth, and organic molecules that give us a hint of the way in which life evolved out of non-living chemicals on this Earth, if that's the way, in, in fact, in which it happened here. The surface of the moon can be the Rosetta Stone of the Earth and the solar system and reveal the answer to ancient mysteries. Now, here in New York is ABC News commentator Frank Reynolds. And good afternoon from ABC Space Headquarters in New York. With me is our science editor, Jules Bergman, and we are on the air today to bring you a complete report on some very, very important maneuvers to be performed by Apollo 11. Basically, uh, the spacecraft is now about 1,000 miles from the moon and is about to move into position to begin the process that will eventually lead to the landing on the moon tomorrow afternoon. In less than 15 minutes or so from now, Apollo 11 moves behind the moon to the dark side and uh, we will then lose contact, lose voice contact with the uh, astronauts. And after about six minutes or so, then uh, we will have this first big burn of their main engine aboard the spacecraft that will put them into orbit around the moon. Jules, uh, this is where it becomes very, very interesting, right? Right, Frank. About 19 minutes from now, Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins will fire up their big SPS, or Service Propulsion System engine, a 20,500-pound rocket engine, to slow Apollo 11 so that it's captured by the moon's gravity. It's a walloping big rocket engine burn consuming more than seven tons of fuel and propellant. And it slows the spacecraft, both spacecraft, both the CSM and the lunar module are docked together from their speed at that time of nearly 6,000 miles an hour to 3,700 miles an hour. It's a tricky time. Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins are on their own. Behind the moon, we can't hear them. Mission control can't hear or see them. There's the moon turning, and Apollo 11 has swinging up like this in its orbit. It's coming up behind the moon just about at this time. Now, that orbit will carry them about 70 miles behind the moon if nothing at all is done, if they don't do the lunar orbit burn. If they do it, and they're turned around in a retrograde position for a braking burn, if they do it, they descend closer to the moon like this and are captured by the moon's gravity and then swing around the moon any number of times like that. In point of fact, 13 times until they get set for the descent maneuvers and the landing tomorrow. Uh, as they come around the moon at that time. Yes, later on this afternoon, then they'll make another, right. uh, another orbit now burn, won't they, to come down still lower. Right, now let's look at what's going to happen if the LOI burn shouldn't work. They would come up behind the moon just like this, as they are, a little bit of break up there, and swing back to Earth just like that, and land in about 45 hours from this afternoon. There's no reason to think that's going to happen. Yes. We're coming up very close now on the scheduled lunar orbit burn time, and this is the way it would look through our simulation inside the Apollo 11 cockpit at this time. Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins going through the enabling Apollo maneuvers. Control. Here's it's Apollo Control. 49 minutes. Apollo 11 should have started uh, this long burn. Duration, six minutes, two seconds. Delta V, 2,917 feet per second. Given that burn, we expect uh, an orbit of 61 by 169.2 nautical miles. Madrid AOS. Madrid AOS. That's it. The Madrid tracking station has acquired signal. And we're hearing Armstrong very faintly in the background, too faintly to 
Understand. Captain McCandless calling Apollo 11, saying Apollo 11, Apollo 11, do you read Houston? Bruce McCandless calling. reading back his remaining fuel and burn times to Houston. Very scratchy radio communication. The antennas still aren't set, but Armstrong and his crew are obviously in good shape. The yellow eye burn went perfectly. As we were saying a uh, short while ago, while we were waiting really to acquire the signal from uh, Apollo 11, uh, Russia's Luna 15 has moved into a slightly higher orbit around the moon. Uh, they have, of course, promised to notify Frank Borman that uh, Luna 15 would not in any way, uh, well, they promised to notify him in the event of any substantial change in the flight plan of Luna 15. They have still, of course, not volunteered any information about the ultimate mission of uh, Luna 15, and we don't know yet whether uh, they really do plan to go on down and uh, scoop up some moon rocks and get back to Earth with them before the men of Apollo 11 can do the same, but the Russian flight is, of course, unmanned. Uh, we might just go back into history here a bit and uh, recall that day of April 12th, 1961, and our reaction to the Soviet triumph of putting the first man in space. Uh, we've looked back to that day quite often since then. Our space triumphs have wiped out, uh, I think, any vestige of humiliation the United States might have uh, felt at that time, but not the memory of it. Here is uh, an excerpt from a program that ABC News did at that time in 1961 with a youthful science editor named Jules Bergman. Look for the uh, Russian animation explaining how they planned to get to the moon. It seemed quite uh, practical eight years ago. And here is how ABC News noted the one orbit flight of Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space. Historic day, one of the most unforgettable of our century the point of departure for man seeking to reach space. And this man, Yuri Gagarin, major in the Soviet Air Force, is the first to cross the frontier into the unknown of space. 27 years old, quasi, handsome, highly trained, married to a medical student, the father of two girls. Occupation, cosmonaut, the world's first. He has now traveled faster, higher, and farther than any man in the history of this planet. And no other man can yet claim the same occupation or distinction. Tonight, all Russia has gone wild with joy. Delirious crowds in the streets of Moscow, Leningrad, and other cities, hailing the triumph of Soviet science over the West. Russia calls it an unparalleled victory of man over the forces of nature, an immense achievement of science and technology, and the triumph of the human mind. And it is indeed all these things. Now the world is asking, what next? What will Russ try to conquer next in this new world of space? This is what the Russians have in mind for us, a film preview of the future from Soviet science. We're looking at a portion of an extensive film animation prepared by the Soviets of a projected trip to the moon, one they claim will be a reality in the next five to ten years. At the beginning of such a flight, a spaceship propels a multi-stage rocket. As the speed increases, the rocket breaks away, and then various other stages the rocket also fall away. After a time, it is traveling by inertia alone, with no further energy required. Powerful radar stations keep the rocket within the grasp of its radio signals. And automatically operated instruments on the ground send radio impulses back to the rocket from the Earth. And they're received by ground stations. This station guides the rocket with the help of machines to count the electronic impulses. The rocket races forward along an orbit that has been calculated months in advance. But at a command from the Earth, it can launch into another orbit. 
When a rocket has traveled beyond the Earth's gravity, it can head toward its goal, the gravitational field of the moon. Now a refueling rocket sets out from the Earth, and now a rocket is headed into the moon. When it reaches the moon, a laboratory and tank sheds will launch out to explore the moon. The Soviet scientists who designed this project describe it as fully possible. pattern of Soviet triumph in space. Where are we, we ask tonight. Our project Mercury will get off the ground in its first short man shot near the end of this month. A short ride, 115 miles to the edge of space. April 28th is the earliest date. As for an orbital flight, like Russia did today, that won't come until near the end of the year, maybe not even until early next year. And how do our Mercury astronauts feel about the Soviet triumph? Disappointed, they all tell us today, naturally, we wanted to be first. Ten days ago at Mercury headquarters, Langley Field, Virginia, I asked Lieutenant Colonel John Glenn, who may well be our first astronaut into space, how he would feel if the Russians beat us into space. John, if the Russians get a man up before we do, how would you feel about that? Well, that's a good question because we've, we've been asked this many times. Uh, there's only one answer to that. It doesn't change our program one bit. This is uh, like saying that because Henry Ford started a new car first, uh, no one else should be in the automobile business today. The General Motors should have dropped out before they started. Well, this is ridiculous, of course, and it's probably a ridiculous example, but the fact that the Russians uh, happen to get a shot off or may not get a shot off be a little bit before we do doesn't alter the objectives of our program a bit. Our program is not set up just as a race to space. We're well aware of the international implications of this, but this doesn't alter the step-by-step -step progression that we want our program to go through to see that man safely starts space exploration. We have our goals, I guess they have theirs, and uh, the fact that they do or do not get a shot off ahead of us will not alter the objects of Project Mercury. We're not going to change our plan. No. And good afternoon once again. We are, in fact, about to see more pictures now from... Uh the, of the lunar surface from Apollo 11. With me here in our space headquarters in New York is our science editor, Jules Bergman. Jules, these should be interesting shots. Frank, Apollo 11 is now on the near side of the moon, coming up on the Sea of Tranquility, the landing area where Armstrong and Aldrin are scheduled to land tomorrow at an altitude of 102 miles, and we're just getting the TV picture. Let's go to it for Apollo Control. Apollo Control, Houston. Uh, we acquired TV at uh, 78 hours, uh, 24 minutes, 11 seconds. Uh, currently, uh, our orbital parameters show uh, 104 altitude, uh, an apolloon of uh, 170.2, a paralloon of uh, 61.3 uh, nautical miles, those are. This is Houston. Uh, would you care to comment on some of these craters as we go by? Uh, Roger, we're uh, approaching uh, the uh, approach path to uh, ignition. Uh, this is equivalent to uh, 13 minutes before ignition, and uh, we're at about 80 degrees east, I guess. 83 degrees east. Would that correspond to uh, location you're holding in? Uh, uh, Roger, we're showing your present position is about uh, 77, 76 degrees east, uh, looking back towards the east. Hey, you should be looking back at my Zeno. Uh, Roger. And the uh, we've now heard from all three Apollo 11 crew members during this television pass. Uh, the individual talking earlier was uh, Neil Armstrong. Ranger Schubert. And uh, Gilbert Yu is uh, in the center right now. And this comes up at about uh, a little over 12 minutes before uh, power descent. Instead of, looking, instead of looking back at it, we'd be looking straight down at it. Uh, 
Apollo 11 now flying backwards. Altitude now of about uh, 110 miles, and could be considerably lower at the initiation of power descent. This is exactly the same territory. Eagle, the lunar module, will be flying over tomorrow as it begins its power descent toward a landing on lunar landing site two, now about 100 miles to the west of where we are. Look at uh, register three on the disk key, uh, theta. Uh, theta is increasing toward my uh, desire to 315, and I'll let the hand controller alone here, and I'll bet you it reverses itself. They're just now passing out of Smythe Sea heading uh, along the lunar equator toward the Sea of Tranquility. And we should be seeing the craters Gilbert and Kastner shortly to the south of their flight path. Uh, Roger 11, we're watching the disky now and uh, still coming in beautifully on the TV. spacecraft faced around backwards, hey, looking uh, back. Right side of the screen at the present time, there's the triple crater with, uh, with a uh, fall crater uh, between the first and second, and the one at the bottom of the screen is uh, Schubert Y. Zoom in, it does have a central peak in Schubert Y. Actually, several of them, and uh, you can observe those. Plus the uh, rim craters uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Roger, we're seeing the central peak quite clearly now. Our view of this tomorrow will be much closer, of course, and be down a good deal closer to the lunar okay, surface. into the foaming sea on their way toward the Sea of Tranquility. Yeah, I'm thinking the uh, tendency seems to be to pull the limb down toward uh, uh, the center of the moon as in a gravity gradient experiment. Uh, Roger 11, we copy. Or may have something to do with mass times, or may... Uh, Roger, we've got... Uh, uh, or may have something to do with mass times, or may just be the peculiarity of the disky display. Okay, we've observed the behavior of your disky, and I think we've got the data here to work on it. Uh, let us grind around a little while on it, and we'll report back to you uh, probably in a rev or two. Okay, well, in the meantime, I'm going to pitch down uh, toward 315. Roger. That's uh, Mike Collins, who's flying in the left-hand seat. Spacecraft Commander Neil Armstrong's ordinary seat. Three craters, three horizontal craters that uh, you now have in the field of view are uh, immediately underneath the ground track. The right hand uh, the largest crater that you see is Gibiago uh, P. It's Armstrong. Uh, Roger, we concur on the identification of that crater. Arago B, 
That's the crater Neil Armstrong has identified. A small crater, as lunar craters go, one about four uh, we miles. We see coming up on uh, landmark Alpha 1 here shortly. Roger, uh, Mike said his first look at Alpha 1 at the present time. These landmarks like Alpha 1. Yeah, it's a great uh, bright crater. It's not a large one, but an extremely bright one. It looks like a very uh, recent and now it gets impact crater with uh, rays streaming out in all directions, which uh, should make uh, my uh, correction of foaming sea easy to see coming up on it. Now, uh, Crater Camp is one of the smaller ones out on the, uh, on the floor of the foaming sea. Uh, we've been some 17 minutes now into this television pass, uh, standing by, continuing to monitor. They're now about 80 miles east of landing site two in the Sea of Tranquility, moving past the crater Kant, which you saw a moment ago. This view is from about 110 miles up, too. That's right. They've reached their low point or parasynthian around the moon and are heading up toward the high point. And uh, are picking... Over the television camera. Look at that. Yeah, we show you uh, clarity over the, the sea of fertility now, and uh, ought to have Langrenus uh, down south of track a few degrees, about uh, nine degrees south of track. Yeah, the crater that's in the center of the screen now is uh, Webb. Uh, we'd be looking straight down on it at about six minutes before power descent. It uh, has a relatively flat bottom uh, to the crater, and you can see maybe. Uh, Two or three uh, craters that are in the bottom of it. On the uh, western wall, the wall that's now nearest to, to the uh, camera, near the bottom of the screen, we can see uh, a simple crater just on the outside. And then coming back towards the bottom of the screen and to the left, you can see uh, a series of uh, depressions. Uh, it's a type of uh, connected craters that uh, give us most uh, interest to uh, discover why they're in uh, the particular patterns that they're in. I'll zoom the camera in uh, and try and give you a little closer look at this. Roger, we're uh, observing the dimple crater now. Uh, the central peak that we can see on the orbiter photos doesn't seem to stand out very well here. Well, they're not central peaks, they're uh, depressions in the center. Right. And you'll notice on the uh, pitch drive activity, I still I put in uh, oh, a dozen uh, minimum impulses and pitched down, uh, and I'm still far from correcting back to 315. We're moving the camera over to the uh, right window now to give you uh, language. It's, uh, it's uh, several central peaks. and. Uh, Roger. Uh, we've got Langrenus in our screen now. And Langrenus is an enormous crater about 160 miles south of their flight path, a crater about 85 miles in diameter. And that's Collins and Armstrong zooming in the camera for a close-up view of it. This is Houston. Uh, we're getting a beautiful picture of uh, Langrenus now with its uh, rather conspicuous central peak. Moving along into the sea of fertility. It doesn't look very fertile to me. I don't know who named it. <laughs> well, it may have been named by uh, a gentleman whom this crater was named after, Langrenus. Langrenus was a... reasonably accurate maps of uh, the moon. Roger, that's uh, very interesting. I'll have to admit it sounds better for our purposes than the sea of crises. Amen to that. <laughs> okay, it looks like you're coming inside now on the camera. I can't get behind the steep monitor. I'll uh, bring the focus in, but we're going to be looking down past uh, one of the Lem quads. 
and uh, one of the antennas almost straight down at the uh, ground track that we'll be seeing coming in. Now, I guess this is maybe two or three minutes before power descent. That's Lunar Module Pilot Buzz Aldrin telling what we'll be seeing outside the window here of some of the LEMS thruster quads or little reaction control, control system engines. at uh, one of the LEM reaction control system quads. He's now mm -hmm. zooming past it. Trader Secchi is out my window now, window number two. Stop model 11, this is Houston. Uh, we uh, show you coming up on the Terminator at uh, 7853, about seven minutes from now. And uh, we've also got the sweeping along at about 3,700 miles, an hour over the moon. How far are they from the landing site now? Okay, it looks like uh, we had Secchi K by about uh, 10 seconds ago, coming up on Apollo Ridge. from the same TV picture we're all looking at. I don't know if you can make that, but in the uh, sea of fertility, there are a number of uh, crater, craters that are just barely discernible, old, old craters whose uh, outlines are just barely able to be seen. Roger, I think we can make them out. Uh, the color uh, really enhances our ability to discern features and craters uh, over what we uh, see in real time on our black and white monitor. Right, the, uh, at these low sun angles there's no trace of brown. It's uh, now returned to a, a very uh, gray appearance and uh, like uh, the Atreus does, it has a look of uh, plaster of Paris to it at the sun angle, which uh, is completely lacking at, at higher sun angles. Roger. now some 25 minutes into our television pass. And shortly, just along okay, here... This is uh, right close to ignition point for power defense. Uh, just passing Mount Maryland. That's uh, a triangular-shaped mountain that you see in the uh, center of the screen at the present time with the crater Seki Seda. Uh, on top of the far northern edge of the mountain. Um, I think we're getting a good view of Mount Maryland and of Secchi Satan. That was Neil Armstrong. They're about 260 miles east of the landing site, just about the point, as Armstrong was saying, where they'll ignite the LEMS descent engine tomorrow and, uh, to begin their landing. At, uh, what we call Boot Hill it occurs 20 seconds into the descent. And it's easy to see what's on Armstrong's mind. Sure. 
watching this pass with a great deal of interest in Mission Control Center is uh, Pete Conrad, uh, the uh, commander for the Apollo 12 mission. Right edge of the screen, Sensorina T. Now passing uh, the one minute point in our descent. Roger, and for your information, your current altitude is uh, 148 nautical miles above the surface. The clustered sensor in this crater. I'm unable to uh, determine altitude at all looking out the window. I couldn't tell whether we're down at 60 or up at 170. I bet you could tell if you were down at 50,000 feet. Clustered Sensorinus craters will be hearing more of tomorrow right along their flight path as they do the power We're descent pattern. Some uh, steep ridges here, uh, the edges of old craters that uh, were photographed by Apollo 10 and uh, those, the crew of Apollo 10 was very impressed with the steepness of these ridges when they came over them at uh, about 50,000 feet. Roger, we can uh, observe they're also steep even from this altitude. You've got uh, quite a shadow being cast by the sun at these low angles. The entire uh, surface is getting uh, considerably darker than uh, uh, the surface that we looked at uh, previously with, when the sun was uh, quite high above us. The crater in the right crater in the center of the screen now, uh, the smaller one is Sensorina. Uh, Roger, we show you a little over one minute from the Terminator at the present time. Sensorina is a crater about 18 miles in diameter, and what Armstrong is doing is flying uh, right down the glide slope. Of, uh, the picture you're receiving, uh, I think we ought to open up the F-stop thumb as we approach the Terminator. Uh, yeah, the, the brightness is still doing uh, quite well. You can go ahead and uh, open it up a stop or two. The uh, automatic light level compensation seems to be working beautifully. It's going to get dark at about the same time they pass over landing site two as they hit the Terminator. That's a good picture of Boot Hill. One of the landmarks in the right. 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 Uh, into the descent. Roger, we're seeing Boot Hill now. And the next crater coming into the bottom, that's Duke Island right there, and to the left, the uh, crater, the largest of the crater near the center of the picture right now is Masculine W. This is a position check during descent at uh, about 3 minutes and 39 seconds, and it's our downrange position check and cross-range position check prior to uh, yawing over face up uh, to acquire the landing radar. At this point, uh, we would be unable to see the uh, surface below us until uh, getting very near the landing area. And what Neil Armstrong is saying is that right, at this point... Right, you get a, uh You get a real good uh, look at that tomorrow afternoon. We won't see it this way tomorrow afternoon, of course, because the little TV camera inside the command module won't be with them. And U.S. Rail is the one that was referred to in Apollo 10 as Sidewinder. Good name, too. Sidewinder Diamondback. Looks like a couple of snakes down there in the lake bed. They would now be at about 37,000 feet over the moon if they were in the landing procedure. And we're approaching the Terminator now. Uh, see the contrast uh, uh, increase, and only the sunlit side of the bridges uh, remain illuminated while the dark sides in the shadow will become completely black. 
11. This is Houston. The picture is getting a little grainy now. You might go ahead and uh, open up the F-stop. Darkness. That one crater, uh, the upper part of which you see, uh, lower part completely in darkness, a small, well-defined crater is bulky, which is about a beam of the landing site. Uh, Roger, we can just see it looks like uh, a little less than half of its rim right now. And it would appear that the orbit of Apollo uh, can make out, uh, is perfect. Just barely some features uh, on the surface, maybe from uh, Earth shine. The crater Mulkey there, about 30 miles south of their track. Are you wide open on the F-stop at this time? Wherever you are. Hmm. Yeah, and it looks like uh, we're just about to get the sun uh, coming into the lens, so we'll have to move the camera away. Roger. Uh, we can't see any Earth shine or any uh, surface features at all in Earthshine now due to the fact that the lamp is very bright and is uh, causing our pupils to contract. Neil Armstrong took us, took us through a dress rehearsal or a typical instrument landing glide slope uh, procedure showing how he'll do the PDI, the Power Descent Initiate Burn tomorrow, to bring Eagle, their lunar module, down to the landing site, lunar landing site too there. And even more important was that he was right on the money, right on the right track, for, not four or five miles south, as Apollo 10 had been over that same site. Uh, apparently, the LOI burn, the trajectory and navigation guidance work, has been absolutely flawless. Armstrong appears to be all set up. Well, and as one of the men just said, it uh, looks like the lamb is ready to go down, wants to go down. Well, it's, uh, in a way, a million light years between the flight of uh, the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk, but it's not, not so very long at that when you stop to think of the actual calendar time. But, of course, there have been tremendous strides. Nobody could have dreamed, uh, no realist, I guess, could have dreamed when the, at the time of the Wright brothers' flight that uh, less than 70 years later, people would actually be on the surface of the moon. Let's, uh, we have a film package for you. Uh, ABC's Don North has put it together to uh, just trace the history of flight. Here's Don North. Incredible as it may seem, there is only 66 years between this, the first successful aircraft to fly, and the flight of the Apollo 11 spacecraft. 66 years between the flights of Wilbur Wright and Neil Armstrong. It was in this aircraft, a frail combination of wire, wood, and cloth, on December 17, 1903, that Wilbur Wright launched on the sands at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, and flew for 12 seconds. He covered a distance of 120 feet. A modest beginning, with few Americans realizing the significance of this achievement. The Wright brothers alone seemed to realize the significance of what they had done. Later, Orville Wright said that it was the first time in the history of the world in which a machine carrying man had raised itself by its own power, raised itself into free flight, and sailed forward on a level course without reduction of speed, and finally landed without being wrecked. A single still photographer was there to record the event. He made this photo. There were no newsmen present. Later, only one newspaper, the Norfolk, Virginia Pilot, printed the story, but they got most of the facts wrong. This film shows an early glider flight about 1902. It was through their experiments with kites and gliders that the Wright brothers developed their successful aircraft. Seen directing operations here, Wilbur Wright on the left. After 1903, the Wright brothers flew their planes in Europe for the governments of France, Germany, and Italy and achieved worldwide attention. This is the younger Orville Wright. In 1909, they demonstrated this aircraft for the U.S. Army at Fort Myer, Virginia. With Lieutenant Frank Lahm as the passenger, Orville Wright, shown here, satisfied the Army's requirements and Secretary of War Howard Taft awarded them a prize of $30,000. It was in Italy before King Emmanuel that some of the finest film of the Wright brothers' early flights was made. The European powers were very interested in developing the airplane for military purposes, and later Orville Wright was to regret the use of the aircraft he developed in war. He said, I feel about it as much as I do about fire. I regret its danger, but I'm glad the human race discovered it. 
This is a catapult launch, similar to the idea of a launch from a modern aircraft carrier. There was a brave cameraman here, and notice they never flew very high, about 30 to 50 feet in those days. They weren't too sure of themselves. It was during this demonstration that the first film was made in the air. An intrepid cameraman climbed aboard beside Orville Wright, and they took off down the launch pad to take the first film shot from an airplane. All right, they've just received the go signal from uh, mission control to undock. That will take place uh, around on the far side of the moon. So Jules, Eagle, and Columbia will now come into their own, won't they, on their own? They're on their own, and uh, they are pretty well committed at this point, and no one particularly concerned about it. Eagle has uh, checked out amazingly well, far better than it. Uh, our most lunar modules uh, and most command modules have done on the ground, and certainly better than any of the astronauts have been able to do in the simulators. It seems to be the story which Stafford and Frank Warman and many other astronaut space commanders have told us that when you get up there in the real vehicle, it's much easier than in all the practice sessions. It's much, e much easier than in the hundreds of hours in altitude chambers and in test uh, rigs on the ground. The real thing is always easier to fly. And uh, this is the way it will be. This is the way it is now, we should say just before undocking, which takes place on the far side of the moon with uh, the command module, Columbia, on the left-hand side of our frame, of course. Dock to Eagle, the lunar module, both of them passing in an orbit some 60, 60 miles over the moon. Actually, the orbit varies between 55.9 and 63 nautical miles over the moon's surface. Mike Collins alone now in the command module. Let's go to, to Houston for a little air to ground in these final moments before loss of signal. We just heard Collins talking to Capcom Charlie Duke. Let's see if we can pick them up again. There's the scene in Apollo Control in Houston. Some tenseness at the consoles. A quiet scene, a busy scene, as they watch and wait. As flight director Gene Kranz, an expert at this kind of thing, the flight director in charge of the descent maneuver and the lunar touchdown, has his team yeah, drill. Columbia, over. Roger, there'll be no television in the undocking. I have all available windows either full of heads or uh, cameras, and I'm busy with other things. We concur, over. Uh, uh, Eagle, Houston, we'd like you to select half Omni now. It'll be good for both the LOS and AOS, over. Uh, Roger, going to half Omni. And that was Mike Collins confirming that the live television he'd hoped to do of the undocking now cannot be done. They're switching antenna positions, which is why the signal has suddenly gotten scratchy there. As Eagle and Columbia go over the hill, as the astronauts call it, around the western side of the moon. Apollo 11 is on the far side of the moon, and we are about 25 minutes away now from the point at which they will undock, which will separate the two spacecraft. Eagle and Columbia. And Jules Bergman is down in our mock-up of uh, Eagle with Dick Sprague. Jules? Frank, we're in our own Eagle, if you will, our lunar module mock-up here at ABC Space Headquarters with Grumman consulting pilot Dick Sprague, who's right now in what everybody's going to hear is the CDR station, the spacecraft commander station, where Neil Armstrong will be flying Eagle down to the landing. Uh, up tight, if you will, to that uh, triangular window, Dick. Is that right? Right, this will be Neil's position as he's approaching the surface. Right, now what, Dick, these landing scribes of the LPD, the landing point designator, looks like an old-fashioned reticle across there and a telescopic set on the rifle. What does Neil do with that? Well, when he stands in the correct position, or the design eye position, aligns these scribes on the inner and outer glasses, he is then looking out uh, at a point on the lunar surface when the computer tells him to, Right. And it tells him how many degrees down on that scribe line to look. He will then be looking at the point that the computer is, has decided to land him at. For example, if it says 33 degrees, as it not right. only does in the flight plan at right. uh, low gate, that's where 500 feet above the moon's surface, that's where Neil wants it to be. And Buzz, I'm standing in Buzz Aldrin's position here, Buzz wants it to be for the actual lunar touchdown. We're going to take you. We're going to take you through that touchdown now via 
the animated film, picking up with the undocking that's due to take place about 25 minutes from now on the 13th revolution of Eagle and Columbia, their command module, as they pass behind the moon, the far side of the moon. As the animation shows, the two vehicles undock and pull away from one another, and Neil and Buzz are there, and Eagle, their command module, getting ready to start down. There they are, tight at the windows, as Dick Sprague showed us. The descent engine fires, that 10,500-pound dips engine, as you'll hear it called, in the DOI, or Descent Orbit Insertion Maneuver, which will lower their altitude from 60 miles around the moon, which is what is it now, down to the 50,000 feet where Tom Stafford and Gene Sternen in Snoopy, their lunar module on Apollo 10, got to. Then after successfully getting down to 50,000 feet, and what really is a continuous maneuver, they do the PDI, or Power Descent Initiate uh, Burn, which takes them from 50,000 feet down to the moon's surface. PDI begins 260 miles west of uh, the landing site in the Sea of Tranquility, slowing them down all the way until they finally do the final descent vertically like a helicopter, coming down very, very slowly to what should be a smooth landing. The actual landing area, a 3.2 by 1.6 mile ellipse in the Sea of Tranquility, about a mile and a half by about four miles in size. Uh, all the maps so far indicate that ellipse is smooth, that Armstrong and Aldrin should have no trouble. That's the way it'll look as they touch down on the moon's surface. Not long ago, I, uh, I talked with Neil Armstrong about well, basically the dream that will climax with Apollo 11. Uh, you're supposed to be, and you are a pilot, not uh, a philosopher, but uh, you are going to be the first man to land on the moon. You must have thought well beyond the technical, purely scientific aspects of this mission. So I want to ask you really a kind of an impossible question, but you're the man that, to give the answers. What do you think this mission will tell us about, uh, about man? If we are successfully able to execute a touchdown and return, it's going to give us the, an unmeasurable amount of confidence. I think that's probably the greatest result of the flight. It's going to assure those, those people who have been spending uh, long hours late at night for many years in the computer labs across the street and in the simulations uh, over in the other building and in the program offices that uh, the, the almost staggering technical job that they tackled is in fact possible for for man to conquer and uh, given that confidence uh, we will then be in a much better position to accurately judge what we should tackle in the future if it won't be marred by a lack of understanding of what can and can't be done it can be judged on its values do you think it might help us to uh, maybe solve some of our uh, less exotic problems here at home on earth well i certainly hope that uh, that we would take the the more successful uh, approaches that have been used in this kind of a uh, program and find ways to apply those approaches to to other problems i uh, I, I don't necessarily agree that uh, just because these people have been in this in this uh, approach have been successful that uh, we uh, should uh, take their resources away from them and give them to, s to some other people who have been less successful in their endeavors. I get the impression you think we might be able to do both. Well, I certainly think we can. We're a great country. Uh, we have a lot of abilities and uh, when we direct our efforts uh, toward an understood goal, we, uh, we usually solve the problems. You know, I think I was wrong in putting that question to him in the, the way I phrased it. Uh, he is a philosopher, too, as well as a pilot. He's a young man who uh, means what he says and says what he means. We're back in mission control now to see if we can't get some more communication. Yes, in Columbia, my uh, disk is reading 4.9 in X, or 5.0 make it, and uh, EMS uh, 105.4, over. Roger, right, copy, Columbia, columns. it looks good to us, over.
We should have confirmation of the separation burn momentarily. Colin said a few seconds ago to Armstrong and Aldrin, you've got a fine-looking flying machine there, meaning he'd go on his Houston, goal. we'd like you to terminate average G, over. Now to get confirmation of this separation burn. Right, Frank. A quiet time there. Uh, the burn should just have happened. They'll still be in the visual sight of one another, though, won't they? Right. They'll stay in visual sight for quite some time uh, as they slowly drift apart. Collins does a small reaction control reaction control system thruster burn with Columbia's thrusters. Slowly pulls away and watches Eagle. Indeed, he can see Eagle uh, all the way down, almost to landing. You'll see it This is Apollo down. Control. That uh, separation maneuver was performed as scheduled, uh, giving the uh, command module a, a delta V of about 2.5 feet per second, uh, which should give a separation to the two vehicles of about uh, 1,100 feet at uh, the beginning of the descent orbit insertion maneuver. This is Frank Reynolds with Jules Bergman at ABC Space Headquarters in New York. I should tell you, we should tell you what uh, Armstrong uh, radioed to Mike Collins as he moved away in Columbia after the uh, separation burn. He said, you're going right down US-1, Mike. And Collins moved away, and now they are flying in tandem, so to speak, until the time comes for the DOI, or the Descent Orbit Initiation, when they will start down in Eagle toward the surface of the moon, and Mike Collins in Columbia continues, of course, to orbit around a sort of a watchful mother hen to watch every every move they make in the event they encounter any difficulty on the way down he does have the capability to go to a certain point a certain point and uh, try to rescue them and of course he'll be very happy to see them come back when they crawl through that tunnel again he late tomorrow get, afternoon he can get pretty low frank well, how, how far down can he go? He well, said the other day about 10 miles, didn't he? It varies a little bit, but uh, Collins has apparently rehearsed the fine art of rescue uh, in abort modes to the point where he can actually get the Columbia command module down to 20 or 25,000 feet above the moon's surface if he has to in the unlikely event that all the lunar module's engines failed and uh, Armstrong and Aldrin couldn't abort by themselves to get back up to the Columbia. So Collins can get down within five miles of the moon's surface. Within five miles. That's pretty service. low. It sure is. He's at about 69 or 70 now. I remember, I think you were there when we, I talked to Mike that day, and Mike's principal concern was oh, no one is sure how high some of those craters, are, how low some of the craters are, and how high many of the mountains are on the moon's surface, and you're coming along. It's like, it's like avoiding television towers and buildings and an airplane coming in in a rainstorm. You've got to be darn sure what's going on. So that's one big thing he's worried about. Yes. You like trying to land at, uh, I'll say, one of New York's airports without knowing very much about uh, how the buildings were around New York. Well, we thought uh, we'd have some, uh, some heavy thinkers here now for a change and uh, take a small break while Jules and I get a moment of rest. And uh, we're, going to, uh, we're going to have some thoughts by three people, three very important people, about... Uh, why we should be going to the moon. Here's Bill Moyers, the editor of Newsday, Marshall McLuhan, the philosopher of communications technology, and Ian McCard, the a regional planner, amateur ecologist, author of Design with Nature. ABC's Howard K. Smith asked, her, asked Mr. McCard about the motives that send Earthmen to the moon. I would give all honor to the astronauts and NASA for this, you know, phenomenal adventure. But it seems to me there are two motives here, one of which is good and the other, I think, quite bad. One, the, the, the good motive is the, the increase in man's knowledge. Uh, the bad motive, I think, is the, the motivation of conquest. And uh, I think our attitude to nature has been throughout the whole Western tradition one of conquest. 
we talk about conquering Mount Everest and conquering the moon and conquering space. And we have, you know, traditionally this whole culture, thick, okay. low-browed, dull-witted, uh, territorial, uh, laying bludgeoning strokes across, uh, you know, the world life body, destroying and singing peans of self-praise as we go. And I think there is a, an aspect of this, you see, in the conquest of space, that it is really based, it's the that, same witless... It's metaphoric, though. When man. you say the conquest of space, you mean it's a metaphor. Oh, I think it's not a metaphor. I really believe the Western tradition does believe that man has a moral duty to mm -hmm. conquer nature. I mean, he is exclusively divine, or so the uh, Genesis tells him, given dominion over life and non-life, and joined to subdue the earth. And by God, the whole Western tradition, Judaic and Christian, has tried to give the best evidence of this uh, dominion and subjugation that it possibly can. And uh, the conquest of space is just one of the spin-offs of this arrogant, anthropocentric, witless, clottish man who insists on in subjugating the earth and all creatures. I don't look at it that no, way. I was going to ask I, you. I, 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 can, I think man is essentially an explorer. He's always reached out into the unknown. And Mr. McLuhan said earlier that uh, if something can be done, it will be done. And man is going to determine that uh, he can do this. I think it is not a, a greedy, asp uh, avaricious reach for something that he would like to control as much as it is for something about which he would like to know more. And I think as long as there is something unknown, man will be trying to reach for it. What I've learned from all of this is that, that man also, as a political animal, has the capacity to organize himself and his peers in such a way to attain a goal that uh, a decade ago seemed to be impossible and seemed to be forbidding. And what I hope that we can do from this is to see the difference that exists between what we've done in space and what we yet have to do on earth and organize ourselves to ach achieve the goals which will affect the lives of billions of people on the earth uh, as well as the life that the lives that will be affected uh, of a few men who will make it into space Wouldn't you bill you were in a high place in government at a time when this program was launched uh, do you think that it's been a wasted effort that the money it has been a perversion of resources and skills no i don't for this reason we were not doing very much in the social and domestic field in the late 1950s when we were not searching for the moon or reaching into space. Uh, we have done more uh, on Earth since we have been doing more in space than we ever did in the decade before. That's a, a syllogism perhaps which proves nothing except the fact that, that, that this nation is so wealthy and so rich that it really has the capacity to do what it will organize itself to do and what it establishes as its priorities. But, Mr. Moyer, have you considered that the Russians, who have never had a 19th century, who have many less resources than we, have also accomplished more or less the same goals in space? But at a greater price. You see, their, their, G price. their GNP is such that they could not carry on a consumer revolution at the same time we have been doing that. All right. Uh, and so but they I had to give up uh, something. I don't think we have to give up something. I think we do because it is so much easier to reach a goal that has few political obstacles in front of it than it is to try to do something about some of these problems which have political... It's just a kind of luxury for us to play with these things, whereas it's well, life and death for the Russians. No, no, it's not life and death with them. They, they, they made it a matter of, of life and on death the other hand, the allocation of their very meager on, resources. On the other hand, with Sputnik, they created a very witty pun which was carried out visually little fellow traveler they put this little fellow traveler as an environment around the planet a planet that was terrified of fellow travelers and uh, they put a little one out there to reassure us that it was friendly they didn't and create the pun mr McLuhan. you did <laughs> <laughs> well uh, the word sputnik means little fellow traveler in russian and it was done at the time when fellow travelers were t uh, rather a menace but in our They did world. it for a very esoteric group of men of whom you are the paramount chief. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm very flattered, but I, I, I heard that from a great many other people. I didn't uh, probe into the etymologies of the word. But it is, uh, I, I, I think it's worth considering, uh, since they do have a sense of humor, uh, what the uh, Russians had in mind in uh, the complementarity of this current effort. Uh, oh, yeah. I think they've all, I think at least in the beginning, uh, Mr. Smith, they had a, a military purpose behind their space effort. And I think this is one of the reasons that uh, our leaders at the, that particular time, particularly in 1960 and 61, uh, were motivated out of a sense of reaction, even to some extent fear, which has been translated into the prestigious reach for, uh, 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 to be first in space. But I, I think they really had serious military motives behind well, their uh, are there, when you say serious military motives I, I, I 
shouldn't think military motives half as serious as many others, including educational. But uh, when you, you, you attach the word serious to military, I, I don't. It can be attached to almost any word. Well, there are many military efforts that we're making that are not serious in the sense of our relevance. You don't think of in, the, in the, uh, the you don't think of Apollo 11 as having any relation to our own military oh, interests. By all means, the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, present head of the Apollo program, who is a general, mm -hmm. uh, indicated today that he will be leaving the Apollo program a few days after. Uh, the, success, the flight in order to go back to the Pentagon to apply the techniques he's learned in the Apollo program to our defense effort. Well, well I think, to go back to your, one of your first questions for one second, you said, what is the value of this? Well, there are many esoteric values that are still to be realized. There are many long-range projected values that the millennia were realized, but the immediate value is military. Let's face that, the practical, significant application of our space effort, if it has what any about, pragmatic what, value whatsoever, it's basically ask, military. Let's ask ourselves in long-term uh, projects about the meteorological possibilities of the conquest of moon space. You better ask him. Can we consider the possibility of space platforms that might be might serve the control of climatic conditions eventually on Earth? Uh, the uh, I haven't finished that idea. I'm the wrong man to ask about this. I do know that uh, satellites orbiting the Earth, of course, can have an enormous utility. They they now have uh, elaborate sensors. The Interior Department is going to send up another satellite. Is it not Eris? And uh, this uh, beautiful creature will be able to uh, monitor the Earth continuously and we'll be able to observe uh, things as delicate as the amount of carbon dioxide or the, the pr productive fertility or health of crops, uh, uh, sedimentation in rivers and so on. The whole dynamism of natural processes may be continuously monitored. It, this it material could be put in, digitized into computers immediately. <laughs> And that material can be used by people like me to make regional planning decisions. And this is enormous uh, social utility. A historical moment, a historical point here. Uh, back in the early days of the space effort and, and even into the acceleration of the Apollo program in the early days of 64 and 65, uh, the men who brought to the president, to the White House, uh, the projections, the fact, the research, the figures, were very realistic about the pra immediate practical effects of this whole program. Uh, as far as interplanetary travel is concerned, it will remain for generations to come a very esoteric uh, uh, feasib that, uh, feasibility for the very simple reason that it will be a long time and take many billions of dollars before we can develop uh, the kinds of programs that will make interplanetary travel, uh, vehicles that will make inter interplanetary travel available to more than that, three or four uh, minutes of time. To go to, to the Mars, for example, is a two and a half year yeah. Round You're, trip. Mr. We Boyers, yet you are working on the assumption uh, that uh, the f present forms of fuel and hardware are indispensable yeah. for such travel. One of the reasons they want the, uh, the specimens from the moon is to yeah. see to what extent yeah. minerals exist in the moon and right. the quantities of moon material that but can be used for space fuel. They may not exist, but, but that's one of the purposes. It's uh, not at all likely that we're going to continue our present forms of fuel for <laughs> earthly transport, let alone interplanetary <clears throat> transport. Uh, we can tell oh, by saturation and pollution that we're reaching a terminus in many areas of use of materials. Uh, and uh, at any time, like the automobile, we know the automobile is, uh, we're not, we don't know why, we know it's finished because technologically it has become such an incredible nuisance. But by the time any form of human activity becomes surfeiting and sheer pollution, then you know a, a big change is handy. The hidden uh, change created by Moonshot is the creation of a totally new environment for human knowledge. Well, thank you very much indeed. Let's go to Mission Control in Houston. Columbia, Houston, over. Houston, Columbia, radio loud and clear. How many? Roger, bye bye, Mike. Uh, how did he go over? Listen, baby, everything's going just swimmingly. Beautiful. Great. We're standing by for Eagle. Mike Collins saying that a center order okay, burn. Come on. We copy out. Houston, Columbia, Houston, uh, we expect to lose your high gain uh, sometime during the power descent over. Columbia, Roger. You don't much care, do you? No, sir. Okay. We have access.
position a signal from the LEM. And we're having some uh, antenna problems with uh, Eagle. Power control not yet getting good quality. At this point, uh, Eagle, as you heard Doug Ward in Mission Control saying, is descending through 12 miles, 12 and a half miles over the moon, nearly at the Eagle, lowest Houston, point. Houston, uh, we have you now. Do you read over? Loud and clear. Roger, we see your uh, verb 47. That's Buzz Aldrin talking to Charlie Duke, the Capcom. Yeah, hey, I don't know what the problem was there. Uh, it just started oscillating around uh, in yaw. According to the needle, we, we're picking up a little oscillation right now, as a matter of fact. Uh, Roger, we'll work on it. Aldrin is uh, referring to the LEM steerable antenna. Uh, that comment about the oscillations. Good, clear communication now. The check was uh, right on time. Roger. Armstrong confirming did he's you, finished his checklist. Did you copy the star, uh, I mean the sun check, uh, Charlie? That's affirmative. We did, Buzz. Out. Roger. An eagle now beginning to swing around the eastern side of the moon and back in touch with the Earth. Coming up on landing side one, above which they will do the power descent burn to land themselves 260 miles further east on, on landing site two. Eagle Houston, the ag initialization looks good to us, over. guidance system and the test worked fine. Collins in the command module 50 miles overhead and slightly ahead of the Eagle. Gene Kranz getting a go no go for descent. Houston, if you read your go for power descent, over. English, Columbia, they just gave you a go for power descent. Columbia, Houston, we've lost him on a high gain again. Would you please, uh, we recommend him y'all right, 10 degrees, and uh, reacquire. Columbia, your go for PDI, and they uh, recommend you you are right 10 degrees and try to high, high gain again. So, it's yes. 10%. was Buzz Aldrin telling us he was up to 10% throttle on the PDI burn before the radio communications cut out again. The 10% throttle meaning it's going okay as you descend through 46,000 feet, the last count. And then they had trouble with that lens steerable antenna again. But they're headed downward. Columbia, Houston, we've lost them. Tell them to go ass on me, over. I got good signal strength and flu. Okay, you should have him now, Houston. Eagle, we got you now. It's looking good, over. Hey, Eagle, Eagle. Decent, that looks good. Eagle, Houston, everything's looking good here, over. Roger, copy. Eagle, Houston, after y'all around, angles, uh, S-band pitch, minus niner, y'all, plus one eight. Happy. 
Thanks and things agree very closely. Roger. Two minutes, 20 seconds, everything looking good. We show altitude about 47,000 feet. Right on the money. Houston, I'm getting a little fluctuation in the uh, AC uh, voltage now. Roger. Just the uh, meter, maybe, huh? Stand by. It's looking good to us. You're still looking good. It's three, coming up three minutes. Pretty deep, but we're still good. Position check downrange to us to be a little long. Roger, copy. That was Armstrong saying, we're a little long downrange on position. We'll have to correct slightly. They should be through 45,000 feet now. There's Aldrin again. Houston, you're a go to that thing at all at uh, four minutes. Roger, you're a go to con you go to continue power descent. You're a go to continue power descent. Altitude 40,000. And Eagle Houston, we got data dropouts. You're still looking good. Should be coming up on landing radar acquisition now. The ground beneath them telling them exactly how high they are. Good lock on. That's it. They've got it. They've radar got it. lock. Uh, altitude lights out. LH is minus 2,900. Roger, we copy. At the Earth, right out our front window. Houston, you're looking at our Delta H. Uh, that's affirmative. Program alarm. Looking good to us. Over. 1202. 1202. Good radar data. Altitude now 33,500 feet. <laughs> Give us a reading on the 1202 program alarm. Roger, we got you. We're going at alarm. Roger. 330. 6 plus 2, 5, throttle down. 6 plus 2, 5, throttle down. Roger, copy. 6 plus 2, 5. We're still go, altitude 27,000 feet. Same alarm, and it appears to come up when we have a 1668 up. Roger, copy. Eagle should be slow to 1,200 miles an hour now. Eagle, Houston, we'll monitor That's your Delta A. Delta H is looking good now. Roger, Delta H is looking good to us. Wow. Throttle down. Roger, copy, throttle down. Throttle down. Better in the simulator. Roger. Delta H is looking good to us. Roger, Delta H is looking About 60 miles from their landing site. Heights and things look real close.
Altitude now 21,000 feet, still looking very good. And they should be down to 800 miles an hour forward speed, about 102 miles an hour vertical speed. Velocity as they drop. down now to 1,200 feet per second. You're looking great, uh, Eagle. Okay, minutes. I'm still on flu, uh, so we may tend to lose as we gradually pitch over. Let me try auto again now, see what happens. Roger. Okay, looks like it's holding. Roger, we got good data. They're following their flight plan almost unbelievably closely to this point. Seven minutes, 30 seconds into the burn. Altitude, 16,300 feet. Eagle Houston is descent to fuel to monitor, over. Four to two. Altitude, 13,005. Final radar, radar check Velocity coming up. 9,100 feet per second. Made it, uh, switch over time, please. Just... Roger, stand by. You're looking great at eight minutes. Yeah, correction on that velocity. Now reading 760 feet per second. It's the P-64. Good. Roger. Fido says we're go, altitude 9,200 feet. 830, you're looking great. Descent rate 129 feet per second. We copy. Or about 80 miles an hour. And they're down to 300 miles an hour forward speed, coming up on high gate, the next critical point. Eagle, you're looking great, coming up nine minutes. We're now in the approach phase, everything looking good. Altitude 5,200 feet. Manual attitude control is good. Roger, copy. Altitude 4,200. Houston, you're a go for landing, over. I do understand, go for landing, 3,000 feet. Okay. Alarm. 1201. 1201. Roger, 1201 alarm. We're go, same type, we're go. 2,000 feet, 2,000 feet, into the ag, 47 degrees. Roger. 47 degrees. Eagle looking great, you're go. Altitude 1600. 1400 feet, still looking very good. Roger, 1202, we copy it. 35 degrees. 35 degrees, 750, coming down to 23. 700 feet, 21 down, 33 degrees. 100 feet, down to 19. 540 feet, down to 30, down to 15. There's 400 feet, down to 9. Forward. 150 feet down at four. 30 and a half down. They're uh, pegged on the uh, horizontal velocity. 300 feet down three and a half. 47 forward. Put up. On one and a minute. One and a half down. 70. Out there. 50 down at two and a half. 19 forward. Altitude velocity light. Three and a half down. 220 feet. 15 forward. 11 forward coming down nicely. 200 feet. Four and a half down. Five and a half down. 160 feet. Six and a half down. Five and a half down. Nine forward. Good. And 20 feet. 100 feet, three and a half down. Nine forward. Five percent. How many feet? 
Guys looking good, down a half. Pitch forward. 60 seconds. Lights on. Lights on. Down two and a half. Forward. Forward. Good. 40 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down. Great shadow. Four forward. Four forward, drift into the right a little. Down a half. 30 seconds. Forward, just. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. APA at a descent. Post control, both auto descent engine command override off. Engine arm off. 413 is in. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twain. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. You're looking good here. Okay, we're going to be busy for a minute. I snap the arm on. Take care of the seat. I'll get the stuff prepared. Smooth touchdown. Hey, it looks like we're bending the oxidizer now. Roger, Eagle, and you are stay for T1. Over. Eagle, you are stay for T1. Roger. And we see him stay for T1. Roger, and we see you venting the ox. Roger. Is that right? Armstrong and Aldrin have made it. And Everyone wondered what Neil Armstrong's first words would be. This is Tranquility Base. Tranquility Base. Copy, uh, now 60, now 43. Over. Roger, we have it. Yes, sir, I read Columbia on the high gate. Roger, we read your five by Columbia. He has landed Tranquility Base. Eagle is at Tranquility, over. Yeah, I heard the whole thing. Buff, good show. Collins and the Columbia Command Module. Fantastic. Good show. Buff, reset. There was never any doubt about what Armstrong was going to do. He had a low fuel light on there, his fuel warning light, and he was very near, very near not being able the to do The next major stay, no stay, will be for the T2 event. That is at uh, 21 minutes, 26 seconds after initiation of powered descent. Some of went up to amateur command reset to uh, reacquire on the high game. Copy out. And uh, there seems to be an absence of drama and emotion in Armstrong and Aldrin's voice. They're busy checking out the spacecraft to be sure they can get off the moon in a hurry if anything goes wrong. And nothing has gone wrong, though. Every sign, Frank, seems to indicate it's okay. And when he was at 40 feet there, it says some dust being kicked up by the engine. Yes. He must have set that thing up. We have an unofficial perfect. time for that touchdown of 102 hours, 45 minutes, 42 seconds, and we will update that. It was so unerring, it was almost unbelievable. Eagle, Houston, uh, you loaded R2 wrong. We want 10254. Roger. 
descent took them just a little bit longer than they can calculate it, but outside of that, he followed the descent flight plan second by second, as far as we can He was tell. able to make the, uh, the adjustment himself. He was actually yep. flying it down with Buzz calling out all those numbers to him. Right. Those last numbers we heard were the forward speed and the descent speed of Eagle. Now at Tranquility Base. Two Americans on another planet. Still ahead, uh, the goal these checks go right, of course, about 10 hours from now, unless Neil decides to do it sooner, that two hour and 40 minute spacewalk. Another tough bit of action, but not nearly Moonwalk. the crunch. Moonwalk. Yes. Not nearly the crunch, as you put it, that landing was. Yeah. The next big crunch, I think, is the ascent. Sure. These men breed a confidence in the rest of us, though, by their, their own actions. So, uh, Houston, uh, that may have seemed like a very long final phase. Uh, the auto-targeting was taking us right into a football field-sized uh, football field-sized crater uh, with a large number of uh, big boulders and rocks uh, for about a one or two crater diameters around it. And it required us gun and P-66 and flying manually over the rock field uh, to find a reasonably good area. Roger, we copy. It was beautiful from here. Tranquility, over. Armstrong was right. He said he'd have to do it by manual control. It's a good thing he did, too, because the automatic get to was... the details of, uh, of what's around here, but it looks like a collection of just about every variety of uh, shape, angularity, granularity, but every variety of rock you could uh, find. The color is, uh, well, it varies pretty much depending on uh, how you're looking relative to the uh, zero phase point. Uh, there doesn't appear to be too much of a general color at all. However, it looks as though some of the uh, rocks boulders, of which there are quite a few in the uh, near area, uh, looks as though they're going to have uh, some interesting colors to them, over. Roger, copy. Sounds good to us, uh, Tranquility. Uh, we'll let you press on through the uh, simulated countdown, and uh, we'll talk to you later, over. Okay, this 160 is just like the airplane. Right, tranquility. Uh, be advised, there are lots of smiling faces in this room and all over the world. Over. Captain. Right, two of them up here. Right, that was you. a beautiful job, you guys. And don't forget one in the command module. <laughs> right. Mike Cullen. <laughs> Capcom Charlie Duke telling him to get back to that simulated countdown. To that last remark from Mike Collins at an altitude of 60 miles. Uh, the comments on the landing, on the manual takeover, came from Neil Armstrong. Uh, Buzz Aldrin followed that with a description of the lunar surface and uh, the rocks and boulders that they are able to see out the window of the LEM. One last engine remaining to be tried. 96 engines aboard that Saturn V, the command module, the lunar module, and... One big one remaining untried, the ascent engine for liftoff tomorrow afternoon to rejoin Columbia, the mothership, and Mike Collins, orbiting the moon 60 miles overhead, Tranquility Base. A new word, a new place in the solar system. How did the country react? Well, let's uh, find out about the capital anyway, and let's go to Washington now to see just what happened there. ABC's Sam Donaldson. Okay, I'll wait. Man on the moon. Man. These people are on the Connecticut Avenue sidewalk outside our ABC News Bureau across from the Mayflower Hotel. We have just seen the confirmation that the lunar landing is a successful one, that man is in fact on the moon. ABC News has been providing this service all weekend, but nowhere has there been as much excitement as there has been for just for the last few minutes as we have gotten confirmation of the moon landing. And let's find out what people think. What's your name? My name is Hiram Vega. How has this affected you? Well, we are, we are from uh, uh, New York City. We are Puerto Rican. 
and then we was going to... Yeah, but tell me how you think the moon landing has uh, affected you. Well, I'm very surprised about this. This is wonderful. It's something un uh, unbelievable. You think it would ever happen? Uh, no, I believe it will be something uh, really... Uh, they're going to, have, going to be very successful. Thank you very much. Adam, tell me what you uh, feel at this moment. Well, I think it's one of the greatest achievements in the aeronautical uh, world. When you were a little girl, did you ever think you'd see men on the moon? Well, I used to tell people to go to the moon. <laughs> I don't know. I think, uh, yes, I believe I would. Have you ever had an experience that has affected you quite this way? Well, not in, uh, not in this, no, but uh, in some cases, yes. Thank you so, very much. Thank What's you. your name, sir? I'm Earl Boyd Pierce, a lawyer from Muskogee, Oklahoma. What do you think I about this? I witnessed the landing uh, on the moon. I think it's one of the greatest fe feats of all time. Does it amaze you that it's it, taken it place? It not only amazes me, but I'm certainly it, it, certain that it amazes everybody in this country. Do you think it's, it's worth a, it? It's certainly worth it, and it's the greatest accomplishment of the people of this nation. There isn't a question about that. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. What is your name, sir? Frank. Frank Stanley. What do you think about this moon landing? Well, it's the beginning of a new frontier, the gateway to Mars. What do you think about the astronauts, uh, Armstrong and Aldrin? It's a great achievement. Do you think it took great courage to do what they've done? It took teamwork. Teamwork was all. Are you proud of the fact that we've landed on the moon? Very proud. Thank you very much. Tell us your name. Kathy Walhouse. And your feeling about uh, seeing uh, two men on the moon? Exciting. Everybody's always excited when you go to a new place, when you have a new frontier, when you have hope that perhaps we, as we advance scientifically to the place where we can go to the moon, we don't have to advance scientifically to have test tube babies. Well, let me ask you a question which may seem irrelevant, but we've heard a great deal about uh, the romance having gone out of the moon now, all of the romantic songs. Do you think it's uh, going to be the same for you? No. I'd like to go. Well, in what, what ways has it changed? Because of all of the things that have gone on before in space, perhaps we assume that we can always make it. We don't think anything can go wrong. For example, well, I'm, I'm actually speaking about earthly romance. Two lovers who look at the moon, you see, and... And, and spoon by it as an old song used to go. Is it going to change for them? I doubt it. I don't think human beings change that much no matter where they are. The moon will still be a nice object. A nice object to watch, and it'll be a nice object to live on, perhaps. Thank you very much. We're told now that President Nixon watched the uh, touchdown on the moon on a portable color television set in the executive office building just across the street from uh, the White House. Immediately after the landing, he called the Secretary of State Rogers at home. He said it is the greatest moment of our time. The success of this operation will be immensely favorable and will bring the people of the world closer together. That seemed to be what Mrs. Armstrong, uh, the astronaut's mother, was saying shortly after the uh, touchdown. The president went on to say these procedures are the greatest steps in the history of mankind. And as Dr. Payne may have reported just a moment ago, he told Dr. Payne later on uh, the same modern technology that got men to the moon We'll get them back. Jules? Frank, we're going to attempt to uh, give our audience uh, an idea topograph topographically on the moon's surface of exactly where Armstrong and Aldrin did land in Eagle at Tranquility Base. We're going to use uh, our telestrator, this amazing electronic device, to show them how they what, what actually happened in the landing process. They were due to land if the camera can pan just a little bit left on this lunar topographic chart. A little more left now till we pick up the ellipse that was the original target. More left, slightly more left. There we are. Now, we're electronically implanting on the target card. This was these were the actual descent charts used by Armstrong and Aldrin. The original ellipse. Well, we were too low somehow. We'll try again. That was the original ellipse there. And what happened uh, as uh, Apollo 11, as the Eagle swept in in her approach card over the lunar equator, Armstrong looked ahead and saw that this area had this football-sized field, a uh, crater field, full of boulders, and in effect overshot it. We're a little off on our lines here. Overshot it and came down four miles to the west in a new area right about here, just south of the lunar equator, in a perfect landing procedure. And uh, <laughs> the amazing thing was that he needed every bit of his fuel reserve uh, to do the maneuver with. Well, Jules, the telestrator uh, is an amazing uh, electronic device, Frank, that enables us to electronically write on a television set and directly to home audiences. Yes, well, the thing that I'm, I wonder about, though, this football field full of rocks, uh, had that been charted? Did they know 
In advance, was that in the actual landing site area? That was in, that was the precise actual landing site area, Frank, that was on the lunar orbiter charts. Yeah. Now, the amazing, I'll go over that again for a second. The amazing thing, and I still don't quite understand all of this, is that our pictures were formed uh, from lunar orbiter pictures, which were taken, which were taken rather high over the moon's surface, and apparently uh, missed this area. They were lunar orbiters' pictures were supposed to be down to one meter or three foot resolution in many cases. Remember, I mentioned earlier that that orbiter uh, was capable of one meter, three foot resolution, just about like that. And indeed, the scientists had spotted 6,000 craters, large, small, medium, minute craters in this area. But apparently, the football field sized crater was completely missed. So it was old fashioned pilot judgment by Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong, the the flying kid uh, who started at 15, who came in, saw the problem, and landed long. Used up half of his remaining fuel reserve and came darn close to having to abort, but did a beautiful job. You know, none of the uh, astronauts involved in this historic uh, event, this very dangerous operation, is, uh, is due to become a millionaire out of it. As a matter of fact, I think uh, Buzz Aldrin said not long ago, when somebody said to him, what are you going to do after the flight? He said, well, I'm not going to become a millionaire. Money doesn't seem terribly important to them in uh, that sense, and perhaps it's a good thing that they have other, uh, other motivations. Neil Armstrong gets about $30,000 a year. He is a uh, civilian, of course, as a government employee. Uh, at his grade, he gets about 30000 uh, Colonel Aldrin gets about 18,000, I think, and uh, Michael Collins, who was a lieutenant colonel, gets around 17,000 or so with all the flight pay and so forth. There is somebody who is going to make more from their landing than they will make in a year. Well, not quite more than what Neil Armstrong will make in a year. There's a 26-year-old Englishman. We told you about him some time ago. He made a bet five years ago that man would land on the moon before 1971. And now he stands to win $24,000. David Threlfall is the man's name. He's a science fiction buff. And he took odds of 1,000 to 1 from one of England's uh, largest bookmakers. He said he was just playing a hunch bet. And I suppose uh, five years ago, 1,000 to 1? Well, I don't know, Jules. I think that uh, the bookmakers uh, kind of deserve to suffer their fate. Five years ago, it didn't seem that uh, it would be a 1,000 to 1 shot, did it? Maybe a hundred to one. A thousand to one seems pretty outlandish to me. Nobody was giving me any odds of that kind five years ago. You weren't in the right places, Frank. Well, anyway, <laughs> we have David Throfall in London, and I guess he's collected his check. And let's go to London and see the man. David Throfall is a young Englishman. In the normal course of things, nobody would ever hear much about him. But five years ago, he bet ten pounds. $24 that somebody from someplace on Earth would touch on the moon by 1971. William Hill, a bookie here in London, took the bet at odds of 1,000 to 1. Tonight, with a touchdown on the moon, David Threlfall collects $24,000. Now, when you placed your bet with William Hill, you didn't, you didn't say that it would be an American on the moon by no, 1971. I, no, I, 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 anyone, uh, Chinese, Japanese, uh, a man, woman, or child from any nation on Earth. That was the wording of the bet. You made it that specific, man, woman, or child from any nation yes. on Earth. I wanted to say woman or child because I wasn't sure of the payload you could carry. And I thought it might be tight for weight. So uh, I, I, I tried to cover every option and tried to make it as unambiguous as possible. Well, five years ago, it was a, a bet. Obviously, it was a bet because William Hill was quoting odds of 1,000 to 1. When did you begin to feel that, by heaven, you're going to win this bet? I think it was in 1966 when they proved that they could do a soft landing, that it wasn't uh, green cheese or uh, a mile of dust. Yeah. I think that was the only factor. Yeah. There was some doubt when uh, the three Americans lost their lives and there was a delay in the program. But um, once they got over that, then I was always so. The British are not getting much glory out of this landing on the moon. But here in London, there is a little pride that apparently an Englishman at least is going to get the most money out of it. This is Bill Butel, ABC News, London. Oh, here comes Mrs. Armstrong out of her home. Let's go to Texas. A bit easier now. Yes. <laughs> yes and no. How did it feel at the moment of touchdown? Oh, I was terribly excited. It's a marvelous thing that uh, we have successfully managed to land safely on the moon. 
What was the reaction of the children, the two boys? We were very excited. Neil had a slight problem with a, with a Gemini 8, with a malfunctioning uh, thruster. Perhaps you can move just a moment. Your light is just behind you, just a little bit to the left or right. Uh, had a problem with a malfunctioning uh, thruster. There were no problems uh, this time. It must have been quite a difference as you were following along. Yes, it was. Is Neil carrying anything uh, for you to the moon? Yes, but that's private. You're not going to tell us? <laughs> Animal or vegetable or mineral? Was there any special uh, incantation today, any special prayer, something that you can share with us that you had as you, as those moments near touchdown came? Now we uh, have said our prayers all along. Uh, from the time they uh, had separation, we knew it was uh, go all the way, and uh, I didn't say any extra special prayers at that time. My faith is with me always. I'm told that Neil was a very poor uh, history student as a boy. Now he's uh, made history. Are you going to encourage the uh, two boys to become astronauts? No, I will encourage the boys to do whatever they would like to do. What do you think they'd like to do? That's completely up to them. Ms. Armstrong, can you describe what you are doing at the moment of touchdown? I was uh, sitting on the bed in my uh, room, and I was watching the map minute by minute and following all the craters which they were uh, going over. and. Uh, doing the best I could to follow them all the way. Your husband had to do a little bit of flying. Is that suspenseful for you? No, sir. And there was a little bit of a problem with communications for a while. Was that uh, a tense moment? No. What is that uh, pin that you've got? Maybe you can describe that. It says JA, and it's a model of the lunar uh, module. Well, that's a model uh, pin, which is a model of the limb with my initials on it, which I... <laughs> Dan Armstrong. Very highly. Where did you get this one from? It was a gift. From Neil? Your husband? Can you tell us what you'll be doing tonight from now on? I will be uh, continuing to follow, follow the flight and listening uh, to their descriptions on the moon. Uh, probably reading them uh, in the mission reports again and uh, over and over and over again. Uh, I think it's fantastic, and I'm just about as excited as you all are. You are you following? Sleep at all? Well, I have here a reservation for a flight to the moon as a paying passenger, although I haven't paid anybody anything for this card. It's a card issued by Pan, Amer Pan American World Airways to people who apply for seats on the first flight or the first flight they can get. And you know, more than 17,000 persons already have applied to Pan Am. Uh, Pan Am isn't making any promises about this, but uh, the airline does say quite soberly that commercial aviation is never very far behind scientific pioneering. As Jules Verne said 100 years ago, an American sees no real difficulty in anything. And whole families have reserved space on the first flights, despite the estimated round-trip fare of $28,000 per person. ABC News talked to several happy applicants at the Pan Am ticket office in New York. What, what do you expect to see in the moon, Andrew? Craters. Craters, and what else? Big holes. Well, what, what will be most interesting that you see from the moon? Um, craters. My main desire in life would be to be an astronaut, but I've been a little bit more practical. And I heard about the Pan Am waiting list for the moon, and I decided that would be the next best thing to being an astronaut. So many people nowadays are concerned with weight watching and how to go on diets might be nice just to go to the moon and sense that feel of weightlessness without all the effort. If I ever go to the moon, I think it'll be very fun. I just hope to go very, very soon, and I hope I'm not really that old. The moon, I'm here, would be very sandy and uh, not very pretty to look at, and all these big crater holes and everything else. But uh, I'm just wondering, uh, do you need oxygen to go to the moon? because I need very little of it. I, I would be a very good passenger, I think, to go to the moon because I need very little sleep, need no medication, and I need little oxygen, and I can stay on a liquid diet for weeks. And if we come down and splash, splash down in the ocean, I can float by the hour. So I think it wouldn't be a bad idea to go to the moon, even at my age. Be advised now that the men are going to walk on the moon tonight, so 
Better not plan to be anywhere very far from a television set at approximately 8 o'clock Central Daylight Time, 9 o'clock in the East. And uh, that is when we now expect that uh, they will open the hatch on the spacecraft and Neil Armstrong will come down and we will have this historic walk on the moon. Well, this is, uh, we are covering here, of course, the event of, some might say, of the century. But other things have been happening in the world today. Many other things. And in order to bring you up to date on what has been taking place while the rest of us have been watching the progress of the moonshot, here is ABC's Peter Jennings. Peter? There was other news today. The Middle East conflict heated up with an air fight between Israeli and Egyptian planes over the Suez Canal. Egypt says it shot down 17 of the Israeli jets, but Israel admits to losing only two, and in return reports shooting down five of the Egyptian planes. The Israeli report adds that the two pilots of their down planes bailed out and landed safely in home territory. About the only fact on which both sides agree is that Israel started the fighting this time. And a spokesman in Tel Aviv says Israeli planes attacked Egyptian positions on the western side of the Suez Canal because of what he called Egypt's total disregard for the ceasefire line. A spokesman also said it was the first time the Israeli Air Force had attacked since the 1967 war. It is the Air Force on which Israel depends primarily for its defense. A report on that tonight from ABC's Russell Jones in Israel. The Israeli Air Force, the spearhead of the Israeli attack, is getting an infusion of new blood. A class of air cadets is being inducted into active service. The Israeli armed forces are the nation's elite, and the Air Force is the cream of the cream. These young men are the survivors of training so rigorous that 80 to 90 percent of the cadets fail to pass. They are greeted by General the Minister of Defense, and the hero of both the 1956 and the 1967 wars. The highlight of the show are aerobatics by Fuga trainers, one of the few planes the Israelis permit anyone to get a close look at. The French-made Mirages, Israel's best war planes, flashed by so fast they were difficult to see. The demonstration of firepower lasted two minutes and included napalm, something the Israelis only recently admit they have used. The troop-carrying helicopters are the same type the Israelis are reported to have used on raids deep into Egypt, but the security-conscious Israelis have never even admitted they used any kind of helicopter on the sorties. Much publicized, but little seen except by the enemy, this is one of the few occasions the Israeli Air Force puts itself on display. Russell Jones, ABC News, on an Israeli air base. There is still, of course, a war in Vietnam. Despite rocket and mortar attacks in the last 24 hours, the situation there is considered to be a continuation of what military spokesmen call a lull. And preparations are going ahead for the withdrawal of the balance of the 25,000 American troops that are to be out of Vietnam by the end of August. But turning control back to the South Vietnamese is not a simple matter. As ABC's Ted Koppel explains tonight in this report from a special forces camp in the Mekong Delta. This special forces camp faces as much danger from within as from outside its perimeter. There are six companies of Vietnamese and Cambodians assigned to the camp with their families. There are also 12 U.S. special forces advisors. So several months ago, counterintelligence uncovered a plot to take the camp from inside. The U.S. special forces commander requested that a lie detector team be flown in. The next morning, 55 of the Vietnamese attached to the camp were missing and were never seen again. Counterintelligence has since reported another plan to take the camp from inside. This one is expected to coincide with a military assault from outside. Special Forces has pinpointed several suspects. High on the list are two girls who work in the team house kitchen, the father of one of the girls who is Camp Carpenter, and the uncle of the second girl who is Camp Mason. Far from being unusual, this kind of situation exists in most U.S. Special Forces camps. The American commander in this camp, Captain Brian McDonald, wants to gather more information before he makes his move. And so the Americans mount a special guard every night to keep an eye on their allies. This is Ted Koppel, ABC News, in the Special Forces camp at Basuai. It is a case of watchful waiting in Paris, too, where the Vietnam peace talks appear to have entered a new lull of their own. The North Vietnamese have turned down the latest South Vietnamese proposals on elections, 
but of course haven't come up with anything new on their part. Allied sources indicate nothing much can be expected to happen in Paris until after President Nixon's forthcoming Asian trip. But perhaps there may be developments in Washington after General Wheeler, the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, reports to President Nixon on his just-completed tour of Vietnam. That report tonight from ABC's Sam Donaldson. General Wheeler is expected to return from South Vietnam on Tuesday, bringing with him his first-hand impression of what meaning, if any, can be read into the current lull in the ground fighting. If it's read as a deliberate communist peace move, the president may be under great pressure to reciprocate, possibly by announcing a heavier, second-step American troop withdrawal. While the White House mulls that over, the Senate will continue debate on the ABM, with no final vote any time soon. Senator Mansfield thinks the vote may not come until September. But with the delicate Senate strength apparently shifted in favor of the president's safeguard ABM proposal. On taxes, Mansfield and the Democratic leadership remain firmly opposed to Senate consideration of the House-passed surtax extension bill until tax reform is coupled to it. Republicans will spend the week trying to argue Mansfield out of this position by saying that each day's delay imperils the economy. But all this activity will have to go on without the city's chief resident. President Nixon attends the all-star game at Kennedy Stadium Tuesday evening, then leaves immediately on his round-the-world trip. Sam Donaldson, ABC News, Washington. Those Soviet warships that steamed down the U.S. coast and parked for a while off Cape Kennedy arrived today in Havana Harbor. Thousands of Cubans lined the shore, many of them waving Soviet flags. A hearing for Senator Edward Kennedy will be held in Edgartown, Massachusetts tomorrow. The senator may be charged after that hearing with leaving the scene of an accident. A car he was driving, as you'll remember, plunged off a bridge around midnight on Friday, killing a woman passenger. Senator Kennedy, reportedly in a state of shock, did not report the accident until some hours later. He said he had tried to rescue the woman but failed. The county clerk, tomorrow, must decide if the evidence warrants serving a summons on Senator Kennedy. In Washington, Democratic leader Mike Mansfield said it could have happened to anyone. Mr. Kennedy has my full confidence. Explorer Thor Heyerdahl is scheduled to arrive at the Caribbean island of Barbados tomorrow. He was forced to give up his planned voyage in a papyrus boat from Africa to Central America. Sharks prevented the crew from repairing the storm-damaged vessel, so the sailors went aboard an accompanying yacht. Heyerdahl, in a message today to U Thant at the United Nations, said that space-age man has too much in common to be separated by political blocks or racial barriers. In Major League Baseball today, the National League, St. Louis at Pittsburgh, and the Houston doubleheader at Cincinnati were canceled by rain. The Eastern Division leader, Chicago, beat Philadelphia 1-0 in the opening of a twin bill. And Montreal beat the New York Mets 3-2 in the first of their two games. Atlanta trumped San Diego 10-0. In the American League, it was Kansas City 8, Chicago 6 in their opener. Detroit beat Cleveland 3-2 in their first game. The New York Yankees beat Washington 3-2 in 11 innings. It was Boston 6 and Baltimore 5. California and Oakland are playing on the West Coast, as are Minneapolis and Seattle. That is the news of this planet this evening. Coming up, of course, more coverage of the flight and the moon exploits of Apollo 11. This is Peter Jennings in New York. Now back to Frank Reynolds. Howard K. Smith is in our Washington studios, and he has some thoughts on this moment in our history. So let's go to Washington now and Howard Smith. I'm told that there have been sporadic protests from television viewers at not being able to see their usual and favorite television programs this weekend, and there will probably be more complaints later on. I beg to suggest to complainants that they're seeing what television is really for. Too often we consider this medium just another method of watching movies and seeing what used to be called vaudeville without having the trouble of going to the theater. But its real value is to make people participants in ongoing experiences. Real life is vastly more exciting than synthetic life, and this is real life drama with audience participation. When John Kennedy was assassinated, the nation was overripe for a burst of divisive bitterness. There's no doubt that by being made participants in that tragedy, Americans were purged of bitterness, and television was the cause of that. What the outcome of this participation of hundreds of millions of humans in an otherwise unbelievable human experience will be, we don't know. 
But as one newspaper commentator said today, we can be sure that things will not be the same again. There's one consolation for television viewers of this event. Reporters who go to political conventions have discovered that if they stayed home and watched television, they would find out more than by going to the convention. Well, you're watching on television and seeing things that one very important figure is not able to witness. He's Michael Collins, circling the moon, nearer than anybody else to the landing except the men who have landed. And he has been witnessing less than you. He doesn't have a TV receiver in his module, and you've got one in your home. The dead man reached the moon. It's been two hours, 18 minutes, two hours and 19 minutes, precisely as of now, since Eagle. The lunar module with Neil Armstrong as spacecraft commander and Buzz Aldrin as the lunar module pilot set down on the moon in the sea of tranquility at a new place on the lunar landscape now christened Tranquility Base. All has gone well. They have completed all their emergency liftoff checklist items and have been given the go to stay on the moon for their, so far for the full length of their projected 21-hour and 27-minute lunar stay time. What's happening now up there is that uh, at this point, Armstrong and Aldrin are scheduled to, and we have every reason to think they are, eating dinner like millions of other Americans. So, uh, <laughs> who can imagine any more unusual place for two Americans to have dinner than on the moon at this point? <clears throat> They've also been given the go by Apollo Control in Houston after eating to rest, then to begin their moonwalk at about 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time tonight. In an unusual reversal of procedures, a maneuver that was hinted at by Colonel Frank Borman about an hour or so in an interview with us here on ABC. Now here is Neil Armstrong, a tape playback of Neil Armstrong asking for the approval of the mission control to begin the moonwalk early. Quality over. Uh, Roger, uh, our recommendation at this point is uh, planning an EVA with uh, your concurrence starting at about 8 o'clock this evening, Houston time. That is about three hours from now. Stand by. We'll, we'll give you some time to think about that. Tranquility Base, uh, Houston, we thought about it. We will support it. We're go at that time. Over. All right, sir. <clears throat> so that took care of that. And they have decided now to uh, go ahead and have their EVA, their moonwalk, in, uh, oh, probably less than three hours from now. There has been, uh, well, the definite times have not been decided because, as Jules just pointed out, Houston has told them that uh, they want them to rest after having their dinner or their lunch or their breakfast or whatever it is, but their, their food anyway in moon time. And uh, then, after resting, they will uh, break the hatch and decide to come out and walk in prime time, so to speak. It's very good. By the way, Jules, you talked about them uh, eating. While Peter Jennings was giving the news, we had AOS here. You know what AOS is? No, Frank, what is AOS? Acquisition of steak. Very good, very good. You went a bet on that, too. It was delivered here. Very good. <laughs> hey, over from flight out here. Magnificent desolation. It begins as a simple act of faith. Immigrants seeking a better life on a mere promise of prosperity. These are voyages of great migrations and the birth of nations. But today, voyages are also an escape from reality. A ticket to paradise that, like the boats before them, promised so much. I'm Leonard Nimoy, and this is the story of sea power. Tuesday at 9 on KCET. Next on POV. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. I want to keep acting, Randy. The struggles. What I have to admit is that I don't know what I'm doing. The fears. My greatest fear is to make a really embarrassing, pompous film. And the obsession. My film is not uh, about Vietnam. It is Vietnam. Watch how Francis Coppola's apocalypse becomes his triumph on Hearts of Darkness. An apocalyptic vision, Tuesday at 10. Set foot upon the moon. 
Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin have been on the moon for four hours and 30 seconds. As uh, Four hours and 30 minutes, I'm sorry. It's been a long day here, too. As Jules said, uh, that EVA, that, that walk out on the moon, uh, probably will begin about 45 minutes or so from now. And about uh, 50 minutes after Armstrong steps out, when uh, both uh, Armstrong and Aldrin are on the lunar surface and have planted the American flag, that's when we expect to have the telephone call, the conversation, really, between President Nixon in the White House and the men, the two Americans, on the moon. Man, of course, uh, explored space and even landed on the moon long before Apollo 11. There's nothing new about this. At least as far as Hollywood is concerned, there's nothing new about it. We found a long line of uh, space films, some of them in retrospect uh, ridiculous, and some uh, surprisingly accurate and most quite prophetic. Here is Richard Schickel, a film critic for Life magazine and a student of those exciting space films with ABC's Peter Jennings. There was a, I guess, the first serious or semi-serious picture to be made was the, by the Frenchman Melier in, in, in 1902. Was it really designed to have a serious view of the moon? No, I don't think so. I think he uh, designed it as a satire on a story of H.G. Wells, which was very popular in those no, days. Published uh, a year earlier. Uh, uh, published a year earlier. And uh, Melies was a kind of great man. He's really uh, the first genius of the movies. He invented things like the fade out and the dissolve. But the most important thing about him was he was the first man to realize that you could arrange scenes to tell a story. Before that, we just had kind of postcard views in, in movies. So he was the first storyteller in the movies. Here's a, here then is the, is the first story tale, or the first fairy tale at least, of a man going to the moon. 1902, this is. That's the first meeting of NASA, I think. About what flag will be planted on the moon? <laughs> Young ladies, incidentally, are from the Folie Berger. Yes, and I think they're a very nice feature for uh, liftoffs. <laughs> Here, the concept was, of course, firing the rocket out of a cannon. people considerably closer to the launch pad than anything else. That's right. And you'll see it's a very good, accurate launch. <laughs> now, that's something he really did take from Wells, which is the notion that moon people lived in caves. Uh, they thought that possibly the craters which they saw through the telescopes were the entrances to vast caves and that maybe there was a civilization down there, uh, underground. He's actually an acrobat from the Foley Berger, uh, entertaining the tourists. The moon at that time basically always, didn't it, have a, an image of people living on it? Yes, I think it did. And not very friendly ones, either. That's a technique I never expected to see in 1902. Oh, this is the thing that uh, Millais, having been a magician, was so good at. These effects are still marvelous, I think. <coughs> Re-entry takes a somewhat more primitive form in this movie. That's film right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now you're going to see history's very first splashdown. It's amazing where NASA picks up its ideas, isn't it? <laughs> How that great cast iron thing descends from the moon and floats as well. And, uh, Rainey's version of the USS Hornet. That, 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 that's funny, but strange how accurate. Now, here's a film uh, that Dick has prepared. Uh, 
which shows there was some very serious thought of, about communicating with outer space. Yeah, this, is about, one this is about 20 years later. It's uh, done by two people, uh, uh, John Bray, who was a very early animator, and uh, Max Fleischer, uh, who went on to do Betty Boop and Popeye and things like that. They're trying to explain moon atmosphere. are going to find work on the moon a pleasure. It's going to be very tedious. But there are a couple of things here which indicate this, for example, that one of the ways to move on the moon is with a kind of kangaroo hop, though not necessarily that far. <laughs> How could you be opposed to this kind of outer space idea? between the planets. And Professor Pickering, of course, really existed, and this indeed was his plan, uh, which I think uh, probably had some help on from Rube Goldberg. Uh, <laughs> Mechanic, Lorraine. Yeah, it's a giant hinge. Of course, that hasn't changed much either. NASA today uses language that the layman can hardly understand. Well, that's true. I think there's something very charming about these uh, ideas because in those days, in the 1920s, we had to depend on mechanics rather than electronics to do a lot of the things that uh, are easy now. And so these kind of great goofy ideas were proposed. Uh... necessarily on Mars they understand uh, Morse code, but uh, the plan here was always to, to communicate with Mars, wasn't it, rather than the moon? Right, I think they'd given up on the idea that there was anything on the moon to talk to anyway. scare the devil out of anybody. How do these things stack up to a film critic? Well, as film, not much, but I think there's something kind of touching about uh, our desire to communicate, to kind of get in harmony with the spheres, as it were. Uh, I think it's a long-standing desire of man, and, and so something touching about it, really. I, they're fascinating. Thank you very much, Dick Schickel from Life. It uh, does seem appropriate that as man is about to set foot on the moon for the first time in the history of mankind that we should honor this event and celebrate it with music. So ABC News asked a most distinguished musician to compose and perform an original piece for this occasion. He is a member of the National Council on the Arts. He holds about a dozen honorary PhDs. Last April, when he was 70 years old, President Nixon awarded the composer the Medal of Freedom at a Gala White House birthday party. 
And here in ABC Space Headquarters is the Honorable Dr. Edward Kennedy Duke Ellington. Thanks very much, Frank. Uh, I'm very much honored, indeed, to be invited here today to help celebrate this great occasion. As a matter of fact, I'm so inspired that I think I shall attempt to make my debut as a vocalist with uh, Moon Maiden. How about that? Moon Maiden. Way out there in the blue. Moon Maiden, got to get with you. I made my approach and then revolved. But my big problem is still unsolved. Moon Maiden, listen here, my dear. Vibrations are coming in loud and clear. Now I'm just a fly by night guy, but for you I might be quite the right do right guy. Moon maiden, moon maiden. a fly-by-night guy, but for you I might be quite the right do-right guy, moon maiden, moon maiden. I wanted to write a poem which attempts to give some of the thoughts and feelings one of the astronauts on the moon is having when he first touches the ground of the moon. These are the only men in this world, in the, on the moon, the only men who have ever been there, at least so far as we know. And they've brought the whole human mind and all the cycles of civilization and history, including mythology, with them. It seems a strange and wonderful thing to me that the spaceship that brought them to the moon should be named Apollo, who is also the Greek god of poetry. The poem is supposed to be spoken by one of the astronauts on the moon to the other one, whose face visor is reflecting the earth. The poem is called The Moon Ground. You look as though you know me, though the world we came from is striking you in the forehead like Apollo. Buddy, we have brought the gods. We know what it is to shine far off with earth. We alone of all men could take off our shoes and fly. One sixth of ourselves we have gathered, both of us, under another one of us overhead. He is reading the dials. He is understanding time to save our lives. You and I are in earth light and deep moon shadow on magic ground of the dead new world. And we do not, but we could leap over each other like children in the universal playground of stones. 
But we must not play at being here. We must look. We must look for it. The stones are going to tell us, not the why, but the how of all things. Brother, your gold face flashes on me. It is the earth. I hear your deep voice rumbling from the body of its huge clothes. Why did we come here? It does not say, but the ground looms and the secret of time is lying with an amazing reach. It is everywhere we walk, our glass heads shimmering with absolute heat and cold. We leap slowly along it. We will take back the very stones of time and build it where we live. Or in the cloud-striped blue of home, will the secret crumble in our hands with air? Will the moon plague kill our children in their beds? The human planet trembles in its black sky with what we do. I can see it hanging in the god gold only brother of your face. We are this world. We are the only men. What hope is there at home in the azure of breath or here with the stone dead secret? My massive clothes bubble around me, crackling with static and Gray's elegy helplessly coming from my heart. And I say, I think something from high school. I remember now fades the glimmering landscape on the site and all the air a solemn stillness holds. Earth glimmers, and in its air color, a solemn stillness holds it. Oh, brother, earth-faced God, Apollo, my eyes blind with unreachable tears. My breath goes all over me and cannot escape. We are here to do one thing only, and that is rock by rock to carry the moon, to take it back. Our clothes embrace. We cannot touch. We cannot kneel. We stare into the moon dust, the earth blazing ground. We laugh with the beautiful craze of static. We bend, we pick up stones. This is not the time to run down to your neighborhood drugstore for something that you may have forgotten because we're getting very, very close now to the time when we will hopefully see the pictures of man stepping on the moon, Neil Armstrong. All around the world right now, all around this world, people are gathering in front of television sets. And in some places, they're gathering in rather large numbers. Uh, Central Park in New York, in the Sheep Meadow, it's been renamed Moon Meadow for tonight. And uh, despite some adverse weather, I really do not know whether it is still raining in New York. But people are out. And they're waiting to see the first man step on the moon. They've uh, been invited by the mayor. And uh, this, this, you might say, is one night that it's all right to walk through Central Park. Originally, the idea was to wear white. I wasn't, I've never quite been sure why that was the preferred mode of dress. But they all seem to be having a rather good time, don't they? Christopher Moon Madness. TV, Let's go to Houston now. <clears throat> They're in conversation with the astronauts the on the moon. Uh, they hear everything but that. Houston, uh, this is Tranquility. We're standing by for a go for a cabin depress. Over. Tranquility Base, this is Houston. You are go for cabin depressurization. Go for cabin depressurization. Go cabin depressurization. Roger, thank you. Coming down. There you go. Open the hatch when we get to zero. Roger. And we're getting a picture on the TV. TV. Have you had a good picture, huh? Uh, there's a great deal of contrast in it, and uh, currently it's upside down on our monitor, but we can make out a fair amount of detail. Okay, we can verify the position. Uh, the uh, opening I ought to have on the camera. Then what? Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming. Okay, I just checked. Uh, 
getting back up to that first step. So it's, it's uh, that isn't collapsed too far, but uh, it's adequate to get back up. Right, you got me. Yeah. Pretty good little jump. Buzz, this is Houston, F2, one one sixtieth second for shadow photography on the sequence camera. Okay. I'm uh, at the foot of the ladder. The lamb footbeds are only uh, uh, depressed in the surface about uh, one or two inches, uh, although the surface appears to be uh, very very fine-grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. Ground mass uh, is very fine. I'm going to step off the lamb now. That's one small step for man. Yes, the surface is fine and powdery. I can I can pick it up loosely with my toe. It does adhere to, in the fine layers. Uh, like uh, powdered charcoal to the uh, to the sole and, and sides of my boot. I only go in a uh, small fraction of an inch, maybe an eighth of an inch, but I can see the footprints of my uh, boots and the treads in the fine sandy particles. Hey, yeah, this is Houston. We're copying. No difficulty in moving around as, as we suspect that it, uh, it's even perhaps easier than the simulations of 1-6-G that uh, we performed uh, in various simulations on the ground. Absolutely no trouble to uh, walk around. The uh, engine did not leave a crater of any size. It uh, has about one foot clearance on the ground. We're uh, essentially on a very level place here. Uh, I can see uh, some evidence of, uh, of rays emanating from the descent engine, but uh, very insignificant amount. Are we ready to uh, bring down the camera? I'm all ready. I think it's uh, two miles squared away in good shape. Okay. Okay, you'll have to pay out all the LEC. Now, it looks like it's coming out nice and evenly. Okay, it's uh, quite dark here in the shadow. It's a little hard for me to see that I have good footing. Uh, I'll work my way over into the sunlight here without looking directly into the sun. Okay, it's taut now. Unofficial time on the first step, 109-2420. Sample return containers, the rock boxes that Capcom. Now I want to uh, back up and partially close that. Okay, 
making sure not to lock it on my way out. <laughs> Pickly good thought. That's our home for the next couple of hours. We want to take good care of it. Okay, I'm on the top step, and I can look down over the RCU and find the gear pad. It's a very simple matter to hop down from one step to the next. Yes, I thought it would be very comfortable, and uh, and walking is also very comfortable. You. You're on, you've got three more steps and then a long one. Okay, I'm going to leave that one foot up there and uh, both hands down to about the fourth rung up. There you go. Okay, now I think I'll do the same. This is nominal on consumables. Too much for the, visit, for the visibility right here. 
here without the uh, visor up. Pretty dark. It looks like yep. there's a uh, surface of a flat, rounded rock. And uh, incidentally, these rocks uh, very powdery surface. Uh, Say again, please, Buzz, you're cutting out. And uh, just say again, please, Buzz. I say that the rocks are rather slippery. Roger. Very powdery surface uh, when it's on there. It's still up all the uh, very little fine porouses. Uh, they'll uh, tend to slide over it rather easily. Armstrong uh, getting ready to move the TV camera now out to its panorama position. Traction seems like good. Extra area. Start to uh, lose my balance in one direction and recovery is quite natural and very easy. Jack doesn't uh, go off the surface. Not quite that light footed. And I have the insulation off the Mesa now. The Mesa seems to be in good shape. You have to be careful that you're leaning in the direction you want to go, otherwise, you uh, slightly inebriate the heat. You have to cross your foot over to stay underneath where your center of mass is. Hey, Neil, didn't I say we might see some purple rocks? Find the purple rock? Yep. Very small, sparkly. Uh, is a brown mica substance. Okay, Houston, I'm going to change lenses on you. Uh, Roger, Neil. Neil is now unveiling the plaque that is... Roger, we've got you four-sided, but uh, back to one right side. For those who haven't uh, read the plaque, uh, we'll read the plaque that's on the front landing gear of this lamb. There's, there's two hemispheres, one showing each of the two hemispheres of Earth. Underneath it says, Dear men from the planet Earth, first set foot upon the moon, July 1969. 
50. It came in peace for all mankind. It has the, the crew members' signatures and the signature of the President of the United States. Uh, about uh, 
still be the pair together is 40 feet long and 20 feet across, and they're probably six feet deep. We'll probably get some more uh, work in there later. Roger, we see Buzz going about his work. How's that for a final? Uh, uh, for a final orientation, we'd like it to come left about uh, five degrees over. Uh, back to the right about half as much. Okay. Okay, that looks good there, Neil. Yeah, it looks good there, Neil. Okay. One hour, seven minutes time expended. Okay, you can make a mark, Houston. Roger. And incidentally, you can use the uh, shadow that the staff makes to uh, just getting it perpendicular. Buzz. Buzz is erecting the solar wind experiment now. Yeah. If you can pull that in off a little bit. 
This is Houston, radio check over. Hi, Roger. Houston, loud and clear. Roger, out. loud and clear, Houston. Roger, Buzz. Evaluate the uh, various paces that a person can traveling on the surface. I believe I'm out of your field of view. Is that right now, Houston? That's affirmative, Buzz. You're in our field of view now. You do have to be. All right, you do have to be. Uh, rather careful uh, to keep track of where your center of mass is. Sometimes it takes about two or three paces to uh, make sure that uh, you've got your feet underneath you. And about two or three or maybe four easy paces can bring you to a fairly smooth uh, stop.
And thank you very much, and I look forward, all of us look forward to seeing you on the Hornet on Thursday. Look forward to that very much, sir. already learned a great deal about the lunar surface from their own observations. Certainly the information that they bring back with them, not just the materials that come back with them, will be of inestimable value to scientists. But all the rest of us have learned a great deal about them and I guess about ourselves today. This is Houston. You have approximately three minutes until you must commence your EVA termination activities. Over. EVA termination activities. Over. Roger, understand. I understand, but I have the feeling he's not too enthusiastic about terminating. Columbia, this is Houston. EVA. Approximately one minute to LOS. Over. And one minute. And do you plan on uh, commencing your sleep on the back side this fast? Uh, if so, we'll disable uplink to you while we're talking to the lab. Over.
They're so very businesslike and calm about it. And yet it's still incredible to sit down here and look up there at me. This is Houston. It's about time for you to start your EVA closeout activities. Roger. They've been on their life support system. On their life support systems, two hours and 25 minutes. inside. easy as it once as it seemed in the beginning and also they've had a very long day they've been up for 18 hours and 10 minutes now with no rest break in between since 7 a.m. Okay, 7 a.m. had only about five or six hours easy, I still think they were wise to start okay, this, start this moonwalk earlier than planned seems somewhat less than originally thought, and their supply of consumables, both coolant and oxygen okay, going up. The motion of the step is, well, it's quite okay. unlike any other, okay. any other thing there is. Call it the moon hop. The moon hop. Good, good term. There he is moving up by the... Uh, I'll call it the MH. MH. Yeah. Hey, Mr. Houston, did you get the Hubbard <laughs> magazine? How about an NAMH? Yes, I did. And we got about... Uh, I'd say 20 pounds of uh, carefully selected, if not documented, samples. Houston, uh, Roger, well done, out. Uh, the second box. Uh, Neil was relaying worried he didn't have time to do the, to really document the samples, but got 20 pounds of materials into the boxes for them. Carefully selected, too. Official time off the surface at 111.37.32. Uh, uh, start arching your back. That's good. Plenty of room. Plenty of room. All right, arch your back a little. Your head up against. Yes. Neil heading back in now. Oh, yes. Roll right just a little bit. Head down. And in good shape. Thank you. I'm up and now. Now you're clear. You're rubbing up against me a little bit. Okay. 
Armstrong was out on the surface two hours and eight minutes by our calculation. I'll move your foot and I'll get the hatch. Most difficult two okay, thirds. The hatch is closed and latched. Hatch closed. Apollo 11 landed on the moon. Eagle landed on the moon. They have completed their EVA. They have gathered up their rock samples. They have deployed the various scientific experiments. And uh, voice communications have now been reestablished quite clearly between Houston and Eagle. Both uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin are back inside now, uh, closing out their activities and getting ready for what will be certainly some very well-deserved rest. Let's uh, go to Bill Brannigan, who is in Los Angeles, and he covered today's moon landing on the beach. So this is no ordinary summer weekend. They're on the moon. We got to get down, Eagle. Let's... While the volleyball rises and falls, and while the surf comes up and goes down, Southern Californians are aware there is a man on the moon. This is Bill Brannigan, ABC News, Los Angeles. Here's what happened at Comiskey Park in Chicago. Ball game. <laughs> seventh inning, Kansas City against Chicago. In Chicago, the time is 3.17. The astronauts are just about to land on the moon. And the 16,000 fans here at the ballpark are preparing to do what nearly every other American will do at this moment, celebrate and applaud the space achievement by Americans. Here's how they're doing it at White Sox Park. by 16,000 fans at the Sunday afternoon ball game. An unusual, but this time very welcome, interruption. This is Hugh Hill reporting from White Sox Park in Chicago. Well, we thought we'd talk a bit about science fiction. The uh, guest we just had on uh, in Houston mentioned uh, future flights. And of course, a good many people laugh uh, about science fiction, but uh, I should imagine today, and especially after watching the those fantastic pictures from the surface of the moon last night and early this morning. Uh, people are not quite laughing so readily anymore. We have now discovered that science fiction is, to a surprising degree, non-fiction. Four uh, science fiction writers are here to talk about their literature and the moon. Well, gentlemen, we sit here in the aftermath of this incredible adventure of men. This odyssey of reaching out into space and, in a sense, laying claim to it by our landing on the moon and looking at you three gentlemen who have been such qualitative practitioners of the science fiction art, the question immediately comes to mind, since you've been pretty remarkably accurate in your predictions in the past in your writing, did all of you or any of you predict this landing on the moon? And if so, when did it occur? When did you think it did? We'll start with you, Fred. I didn't predict the landing at any particular time. It was inevitable. It was just one of those things that had to happen. And I expected it to happen within my lifetime. I'm glad to see that I made it. <laughs> and you, John? It's much the same thing. I was a believer in science. I was a believer in science fiction. All this would come to pass. It was a fixture of the present in those days for me. 
it's only a fixture of the present now for others. Did you touch upon thematically the landing on the moon? Not the landing thought? on the moon, no. My few uh, space stories were full of pirates and trips to Mars. And here's the text bad boy of science fiction writers right over here. Isaac, what about you? Well, I tell you, back in 1939, I wrote a story about the first trip to the moon. I placed it in 1973, which so very shows close. the crackpot though I was, I was very conservative. Uh, the only thing was I followed science fiction tradition by having the first spaceship uh, built by a sole inventor, a lone eagle type fellow who built it out of old tin cans in his backyard. And he went around the moon in it without anybody's help. Came back, landed in a tree or something, said, I've been to the moon. Well, you say that half in jest, but it is true thematically that in most early science fiction, it was the lone eagle concept, was it not? The sense of one man facing the unknown rather than the crew idea. Sure, and not only did they build a spaceship in their backyards and take off the next day, but they didn't stop at the moon. Doc Smith uh, had a fellow who was working as a chemist at the National Bureau of Standards one afternoon. Two days later, he had conquered the whole galaxy mm -hmm. in the skylark of space. But I think that that was important, you know. I was lured into science and engineering by science fiction, and if I'd had any idea how hard it was, I might never have arrived here. <laughs> I wonder about that, John. I think in your case it must have been preordained. But having reached this plateau, this lunar plateau, immediately it comes to mind, what is the next basic thematic area for the science fiction writer. We have touched upon the moon. We have, in a sense, predicted it as science fiction writers. I, I use the collective respectful we here, and that's certainly not me. What do you write about next? Where does man go in his science fiction beyond the moon? Isaac? Well, one of the themes I've made use a gr of a great deal has been the man-like robot with man-like intelligence. Now, this is still in the future, and on the other hand, it's still something we're likely to accomplish. So I, for one, plan to stand pat on this to a great degree. I shall continue writing robot stories. I think that for my lifetime anyway, they'll remain science fiction. There will be no live television now of the uh, liftoff, the television camera that uh, relayed those spectacular pictures last night of the walk on the surface of the moon has been deactivated. As a matter of fact, it's going to be left there. And uh, so there will be no live television. Perhaps on future missions, future takeoffs, there may be, but not today. We will, of course, have voice communication, however. And uh, you will be able to hear Houston talking to Eagle, talking to Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin as they take off. After the scientific experiments have been completed, and when the command module comes back overhead within range of their rendezvous radar, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin prepare to launch off the moon's surface. Mike Collins joins Armstrong and Aldrin in a combined countdown that will end the first part of this historic journey. The ascent engine is fired, lifting the ascent stage into a 10-mile high transfer orbit, the first step to rendezvous with Collins. The descent stage, which serves as a launching pad, remains on the moon together with the lunar surface experiments. These packages will continue to transfer information on moon quakes and lunar coordinates to Earth for as long as a year. The ascent stage is shut down at 60,000 feet over the moon. If problems have occurred and Armstrong and Aldrin can't reach lunar orbit, then Collins and the command module can fly down as low as 35,000 feet to rescue them. Then after getting into lunar orbit, the astronauts maneuver using their reaction control jets to place the spacecraft in an intercept trajectory with the command module. Rendezvous radar measurements are used to guide the approach from 350 nautical miles down to the last 500 feet. During the docking maneuver, the lunar module is under manual control. This is the last of four critical maneuvers that Apollo 11 will accomplish. Rendezvous after liftoff from another planet a critical maneuver never before tried by any space crew. The other three critical maneuvers, of course, power descent, touchdown, and then ascent to lunar orbit. The two craft hopefully will be in a continual line of sight relationship with each other during the rendezvous maneuver. Lem is pitched over to bring the command module docking target clearly into view through its upper window. After lining up on the command module's docking target, the commander then maneuvers his vehicle closer. Then Mike Collins in the Apollo command module, who has a far better window view, powers up, moves in, and completes the docking.
Let's uh, stay very close now to Houston so that we can hear any air-to-ground communications. Guidance reports both navigation systems on Eagle are looking good. A beautiful left wing. Scratching communications. Eagle taking off just the way it's supposed to. Vertical rise rate. So a little bit of uh, slow wallowing back and forth. Not very much stressor activity. Roger, mighty fine. Seven hundred one fifty S. Beautiful. Nine thousand. Eagle Houston, uh, you're looking good at two ping zags and missed in all agree. Right on the money, exactly where they're supposed to be. The engine burning perfectly. And a foot per second again, I to ping. Sixty miles away from its landing site. Aldrin is reading the horizontal velocity first, and then the vertical velocity. It's now fourteen hundred twenty-four feet per second vertical uh, velocity. One eighty-seven vertical velocity. You go, Houston. Uh, your go at three minutes. Everything's looking good. Roger. Nearly 200 miles downrange from Tranquility Base. Right on H-Dot. Coming up to the this is H-Dot Max now. Right, right. I've got right down UF-1. Roger. Armstrong there for the first time. Height now approaching 32,000 feet. And Eagle's up to about 1,700 miles an hour, really streaking along. Eagle Houston, uh, four minutes, you're going right down the track. Everything's great. Horizontal velocity approaching 2,500 feet per second. 
What's the beam uh, off for right now? Roger. That's the crater Sabine, exactly where it's Some 120 be. miles to go until insertion. And they're around 220 miles downrange from Tranquility Base. 240 to go. Two and a half minutes more of engine burn needed, called for, before they insert 260 miles downrange. There is radar off there. Right there, Ritter Schmidt. And that's impressive, look at Ritter. Ritter Schmidt is soaring by it. Uh, you're great, three, look at yeah. All three data sources are agreeing quite closely here. The three color plot board on the front of mission control here is almost uh, superimposed as the, each of the three colors are scribed on the scribing plotter. Eagle now approaching 48,000 feet altitude. I am off the center, it's up to the right. High overhead, Columbia, the command module, with Mike Collins orbiting at 69 miles, leading them by about three miles. Eagle Houston, uh, you're still looking mighty fine. Eagle Houston, Columbia, Eagle Houston, Columbia, 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 Six minutes into the engine burn, Eagle doing 3,300 miles an hour through 55,000 feet altitude, an orbit now virtually a certainty. One minute to go in the burn. 4,482 feet per second. Horizontal velocity. Command One minute to go. Command module pilot Collins pointed down. One minute to go. Dang it, I'll press the main shut off. as fast as they need to. Very close. And then the engine on. 90, okay, off, 50, drop down. Right on schedule. They've got it made. They're in orbit. They got 53373, 32.8 feet per second, 60,666. Eagle Roger, we copy. It's great. Go. Here we got got a residual. Yeah, Eagle Houston, uh, trim residuals. Showing a pair of Paraloon of 9.1 nautical miles, Apaloon 47.2 nautical miles on the pings. All three systems are go. A little bit off velocity showing about 55, 37 feet per second, uh, plus or minus a foot or so on, the, on each of the three systems. A little bit low on the paraloon, but easily taking them into orbit. No problem. Last week, when Apollo 11 was launched on its way from Cape Kennedy, one of the uh, guests there to witness the launching was uh, former Vice President, jo uh, former President Johnson, who uh, was moved to remark after the launch that uh, he wondered why, if we can harness all this technology and put together all this effort, we can't do the same to bring peace to the world. Well, we have to uh, remind ourselves of the fact that uh, while we have done all these wondrous things in space and with our technology, we still have not been able, some way or another, to eradicate war from the face of the Earth. And there is a war underway right now, though hopefully it is in 
what is called a lull. Perhaps the young men who were actually doing the fighting might quarrel a bit with that uh, description of it. But nevertheless, the flight of Apollo 11 has great meaning too for the young men, Americans and South Vietnamese, and for that matter, North Vietnamese and BC in Vietnam. And we thought it would be interesting to see uh, how they feel about it. ABC's Kenneth Gale has this report on the reaction of American troops in the combat zone in Vietnam. It was early in the morning, a full two hours before sunup here in Vietnam, when man reached the moon. Out in Tay Ninh province, troops have been tense for several nights now, waiting for the heavy fighting to begin again. For that reason, most of those who did not have to be awake slept through the moon landing, knowing they will not sleep when the fighting begins. Artillerymen were awake, firing wherever the enemy might be. Because of the clouds, the only moon to be seen over Tay Ninh was an artificial one. Flares to keep the enemy from moving in darkness. In a bunker, a night radio watch followed the moon landing with an ear tuned to other radios that might call them to action at any time. Artillery Fire Direction Control Office here at Fire Support Base Buell. Lieutenant, do you think the moonshot was worth it all this? Well, it depends what you mean by, by worth it. From a technological point of view, it was a wonderful accomplishment. Being a romanticist that I am, I feel that men should more or less try to square away their affairs here in this world before they go exploring the stars and the planets. And this is being the first step into the universe. Well, it was, it was the accomplishment itself was, was worth it. But I think that people are putting too much stock into space travel when they should try to score away what's wrong with this world right here. Luckily, the night was relatively quiet at this artillery base in Tain Inn. The men here actually more concerned with the immediate threat to their own lives to give much thought to the dramatic challenge facing the men on the moon. Kenneth Gale, ABC News, at an artillery base in Tain Inn, South Vietnam. Back in ABC Space Headquarters in New York, I'm Frank Reynolds with Jules Bergman. We are less than 15 minutes away now from the uh, time when the rendezvous will be accomplished and the docking actually will take place when uh, the command module, Columbia, will be joined together now with the Lem, Eagle, Collins, Aldrin, Armstrong. I'm so tired that I'm having difficulty remembering those names now. I'm sure you are. Just up there. kind of kind of slip away. We'll all be uh, back together again in the same space capsule. We have an animation to uh, show you just precisely how that uh, is going to be done, how this docking maneuver will be uh, carried out. We're 13 right. minutes away. And they'll be coming out from behind the moon shortly. They should be fairly close together, Frank, when we arrive back in uh, the radio signal area. And this is the way it'll look from inside Eagle, the lunar module. These are the rendezvous maneuvers that led up to the final rendezvous in the docking, the Eagle Lunar Module's ascent stage with the two astronauts aboard, moving in close as it will be in a few minutes, braking gates being applied, firing its reaction control system thrusters to slow down so it doesn't come in too fast to the Eagle, to the Columbia command module. Then when they're close by, rotating itself around into the docking attitude, a very difficult maneuver. The astronauts, uh, Aldrin and Armstrong, looking out their top rendezvous maneuver, as we see in this animation, and as they move in with about 30 feet or so, then astronaut Michael Collins inside the Columbia command module takes the controls and fires up his reaction control system thrusters and moves in very slowly because he has better view of the target docking uh, adapter. And the probe and drogues lock, meet, and the uh, latches close, and they are docked. Shortly thereafter, they will transfer from the lunar module back into the Columbia command module. Eagle, the lunar module, will be cast off into lunar orbit uh, eventually it will impact the moon months from now, perhaps. Uh, the three astronauts will eat and rest in, inside the Columbia command module. Not yet clear as whether Neil Armstrong, the spacecraft commander, will elect to extend their time, their lo lunar orbit stay time, if you will, for an additional eight hours or 12 hours for a rest cycle, or whether he will stick to the original flight plan, which calls for a trans-Earth injection at about 1 a.m. Uh, the Eastern Daylight Time tomorrow morning to head them back on the two-and-a-half-day journey toward Earth 
which will climax successfully, we trust, in a splashdown on the Pacific about 12.52 p.m. That time subject to a few minutes revision, 12.52 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time this Thursday. Let's go to Mission Control now for air-to-ground signals. This is Lunar Revolution number 27 for Columbia. Terry White and Mission Control are still waiting for confirmation of acquisition of radio signal as the clock ticks down. Have the left AOS. There's the signal Lem has been acquired. Eagle. And we should have Columbia acquired shortly. One, of their, one or both of their antennas are out of position, and Houston apparently doesn't want to bother them with it while they're in this critical docking phase. Okay, we're all yours. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's it. Armstrong giving Collins a signal to move in for the docking. Okay, I have uh, thrusters uh, B3 and C4 uh, safety. Okay. Every sign they are already docked. Collins, in the brief exchange we heard, is going through his post-docking checklist, pressurizing the command module's cabin up to 5.5 psi, disabling the two thruster jets you heard him mention, B3 and B4, in preparation for the. That was a funny one, you know. I didn't, uh, I didn't feel it touch, and uh, I thought things were pretty steady. I went to retract there, and then that went all uh, hell broke loose. Spacecraft Commander Armstrong. All right, I got a horrible squeal. Yeah, I agree with that, but we hear you okay. Houston, Apollo 11, over. Uh, Apollo 11, Houston, go. adjust your O2 flow until it just goes off the peg. And then uh, crank the direct O2 valve uh, back down about five degrees, over. bringing up his oxygen flow to pressurize the CSM to the point where the tunnel joining the two vehicles can be pressurized in preparation for removal of the hatch and storage of the hatch and then the transfer. In about an hour and 15 minutes, the spacecraft commander Armstrong and uh, lunar module pilot Aldrin back to the Columbia. The Eagle is back and Eagle is docked with the command module. They don't really have too many great, big, tremendous 
earth-shaking, moon-walking type events to follow through on, do they? You know, Frank, now that we've been through these, all these difficult four days, five days since last Wednesday, launch last Wednesday, and particularly since the lunar landing and the 30 straight hours we've gone here, I am weakened. I am weakened to think of what has been accomplished because by my own checklist, they have accomplished. Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins have done beautifully, performed beautifully, nine of the 11 major hurdles, nine of the 11 major rocket engine burns on this flight. From launch at pad 39 of the Saturn V, from the translunar insertion a couple of hours later, two hours and 44 minutes later, to lunar orbit insertion almost 76 hours after they lifted off, to the descent orbit yesterday afternoon, the power descent initiation that took them down to a safe touchdown. That was event six at Tranquility Base in the Sea of Tranquility. To that heart faking, heart throbbing ascent that went so beautiful, beautifully of three and a half hours ago. Through the steps of rendezvous, which may seem like old hat to those of us who have covered Gemini in the space program, but it was the first time men had lifted off the moon in rendezvous. Through the docking four or five minutes ago, the two major events that lie ahead of the trans-Earth insertion burn later tonight, or perhaps tomorrow morning, depending on what spacecraft Commander Armstrong decides to do, or likes to do, and the splashdown Thursday about 12.45, p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Nine of the 11 critical and dangerous events have now been done. Technology triumph. And all I can think, Frank, is that it's, it's that Eric Hoffer quote I used the other day, that the great genius of America is to take something momentous and make it seem unmomentous. Only in this case, it doesn't seem unmomentous to me. Oh, or to anybody else, Jules, really. The astronauts uh, have been uh, they, they have favored us with some unexpected television shows on the way up to the moon. Of course, nothing they can do can equal what we saw last night. But uh, there will be another television show, a scheduled one, 15-minute color television, of uh, the moon and the Earth tomorrow night at uh, around 9 o'clock Eastern Time. That is possible, of course, that they might, uh, they might provide us with a show even before that. But not tonight. There will be no television from Apollo 11 tonight. They've got far too much to do, and they have done everything so very well indeed. All right, we now have a picture from Apollo 11, so let's go to Houston for the conversation between the uh, spacecraft and Houston. This is Apollo Control. While we're waiting for the television pictures to come in, we have in the control room here a vase full of long-stemmed red roses and a card saying, to one and all concerned, job superbly done from a moonstruck Canadian. Continuing to stand by as we wait for the pictures to come from Columbia. Here they come. Houston Apollo 11, over. Roger, go ahead, 11, over. Are you picking up our TV signal? That's affirmative. Uh, we have it up on the out of four now. Uh, the uh, focus is a little bit out. Uh, we see the Earth in the center of the screen. Uh, still has a little white dot in the bottom of the camera, apparently. And uh, see some land masses uh, in the center. I, at least I guess that's what it is. Uh, it's uh, very hazy at this time on our out of four over. Let me uh, change. I believe that's where we just came from. It is, huh? Well, I'm really looking at the bad... Uh, at a bad screen here. Stand by one. Hey, you're right. Not bad enough. Hey, you should be getting right 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 on your spot. screen now. It's not bad enough not finding the right landing spot when you're going to have to right point it. I'll never let that one down. Uh, we're making it get smaller and smaller here to make sure that it really is the one we're leaving. Oh, that's enough, you guys. That was a good picture there. Okay, that's enough of the moon. Okay, that's enough of the moon, Charlie. We're getting set up now for some inside pictures. Right. 
Yeah, how do you read me, Charlie? Uh, five by now, buzz over. Okay. Uh, more mundane affair. Now that we've left the moon, I'd like to uh, trace through a little bit for you. Developments that have taken place in the uh, food department. I'm sure you've always type of a uh, drink container. A little later, Mike will show you how the uh, water gun uh, operates with its new uh, filter to take out the uh, hydrogen. Essentially, this uh, water gun is put in, in this end and filled up this bag with water, and the uh, drink then uh, dissolves in the water, and uh, this end of the mouth feeding. Uh, likewise, we have uh, other foods that are more solid nature. You can probably see this uh, shrimp cocktail meal. This afternoon, while the two of us had uh, salmon salad. Another early development was the uh, use of bite-sized food. 11, Houston, uh, Buzz, you're breaking up badly. Yeah, uh, uh, would, you, would you check your box over? All right, sir. How am I coming through now, Charlie? All right, you're, you're very clear when you come through. It's just that your box is not uh, keying at uh, every word. Over. Okay. These bite-sized uh, objects were designed to uh, uh, remove the problem of having so many crumbs floating around in the cabin. So they designed uh, a particular size that uh, would be able to uh, go into the mouth all at once. I think since uh, all of our experience, we've discovered that we can uh, progress a good bit further than that back to uh, some of the type meals that uh, we have on Earth. As a matter of fact, on this flight, we've carried along pieces of bread. And uh, along with the bread, we have uh, a uh, ham spread. And I'll show you, I hope, how easy it is to fit some ham.
Simon. He says pretty good demonstration. Houston, this next is a little demonstration for the kids at home, all kids everywhere for that matter. Uh, I was going to show you how you drink water out of a spoon, but I'm afraid I fill the spoon too full, and uh, if I'm not careful, I'm going to spill water right over the sides. Can you can you see the water slopping around on the top of the spoon, kids? That's primitive, 11. Okay, well, as I say, I was going to show you, but I'm afraid I filled it too full, and it's going to spill over the side. I tell you what, I'll just, I'll just turn this one over and uh, get rid of the water and start all over again, okay? Okay. And you can see up here, we don't know where over is. Uh, one uh, up is as good as another. That really is water, I'll show you. thing on the end of it is a uh, filter with uh, several membranes. One allows uh, water to pass, but not any gas. The other allows gas to pass, but not any water. So by routing uh, the gaseous water, which comes from our uh, tank, through this filter, we're enabled to uh, drink purified water without the gas in it, filtered water. And uh, of course, all we do to, uh, to get it started is just pull the trigger. I haven't been at this very long. It's uh, the same system that the Spaniards used to drink out of wine skins at bullfights. Only I think it's even more fun. Well, be seeing you, kids. Uh, thank you from all the kids in the world uh, here in the Moker who uh, can't tell the Earth from the moon. <laughs> You need a wine skin up there, Mike. Let's answer some questions here, Jules. All right, we'll People take some have more been, questions. Uh, sending in questions all over the from all over the country. Here is one from David Dolar, who is ten years old, Philadelphia, and David wants to know: Do they send the lamb adrift in space after boarding Apollo? I am a science fan. I am ten years old. The answer, David, is yes. They so do it, send it adrift in space. It'll orbit uh, the moon for X number of months, and then finally impact the moon at some later time. Mrs. Thomas Fee of Edison, New Jersey writes, if any signs of other life exist, will we see it or them along with the astronauts or have they been advised to screen out such signs if they occur or such sights 
so as not to frighten the viewing public. I don't think there's anything in the flight plan about hmm. not showing us what they see up there. That's contingency plan 7 stroke 4 dash A. I, uh, I must tell you, Mrs. Fee, that I don't think the astronauts have been told not to show us anything. Uh, I think that if there's anything up there, we'll see it. And hear about it. Sandra Howard of Anaheim, California, would like to know, why aren't women allowed to participate in these historic events? If there is some specific reason, I would like to know it. And if not, I would like to know where to get an application. Well, you could write to Jules. Would you be able to tell her, Jules? How to get an application? <laughs> I don't know of anybody in the space program, Frank, especially any astronauts who are against having women aboard spacecraft or women in the space program. There are certain basic biological problems that have not yet been met and conquered, namely an ordinary uh, well, the, the mixed Russians. crews. Yeah, but, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the fact that the Russians did... Uh, the Russians did get Valentina right. Tereshkova up in uh, one of their early spacecraft. The basic real reason is that the space agency up to now has insisted that only qualified jet test pilots could fly as astronauts until about two years ago when they started taking scientist astronauts and training them as pilots. Mm. And up to the point of that, up to that point, no qualified women test pilots had, had applied to NASA. Otherwise, NASA would have had a hard time rejecting them. So... But there is a reason to think that on future flights of several years from now that scientists, women scientists, may fly aboard as astronauts. Peter Jennings is standing by along with Tom Gerrell, and they will move in here to uh, continue this coverage. But first, Peter is going to bring us up to date on the news of the day other than the moon landing. Good night. In Saigon, ABC's Frank Mariano asked Vice President Win Kao Ki if the moon landing would affect the war. He said he didn't think so. He said that a more realistic problem was the war. He said that if there could only be peace, the people could devote themselves to rebuilding a country, and he would retire from politics. The tug of war over how to achieve a political peace goes on endlessly in Saigon. A central figure in that tug of war is President Tu, and he is being pushed and pulled by powerful opposing forces. ABC's Craig Spence explains it in this report. President Tu is a man in the middle. On his left is the U.S. Embassy, at first suggesting, then nudging, and now pushing Tu into compromising with the National Liberation Front. On his right is the Saigon military clique, at first agreeing, then resisting, and now opposing any compromise with the National Liberation Front. Vice President Key has become the chief spokesman of this group. It's led by the generals and backed by the rich, the Catholics, and northerners who fled south when Ho Chi Minh took power. What Vice President Ki said publicly the other day at the National War College is what this group believes privately, that the U.S. wants to sell out to the Viet Cong. Ostensibly, America spent billions of dollars in economic and military aid to build a strong government, one that would create a genuine national revolution to steal the thunder from the communists. Unfortunately, too much of our aid went not to the peasant, but to the very powers who opposed any change. The military clique did not use this aid to spread social justice and political reform, but instead to consolidate its own position, including drafting, jailing, and exiling serious dissent. Now the U.S. is in the unenviable position of having financed and strengthened its own opposition. And it's this opposition that prevents President Tu from seriously compromising with the National Liberation Front. Craig Spence, ABC News, Saigon. The police chief of Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts, will file formal charges today against Senator Edward Kennedy, accusing the senator of leaving the scene of a fatal accident. In compliance with state law, Chief Dominic Arena already has sent Kennedy notice by registered mail that a complaint is being filed in the death of Mary Jo Kupechny, who was drowned early on Saturday. Kennedy, as you will probably remember, was driving Miss Kopechny to Egdertown after a dinner party when their car skidded off a bridge and landed upside down in eight feet of water. After Chief Arena files his formal complaint, Senator Kennedy will have 24 hours in which to request a hearing. Since reporting the accident to police 10 hours after it happened, Kennedy has been in seclusion at his home on Squaw Island. In Washington, the Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield expressed his deep sympathy for the Kennedy family and said that he had every confidence in the senator. Senate Minority Leader Everett Dirksen declined to comment on the potential political effect of the accident. 
The city of York, Pennsylvania has undergone a fourth night of racial trouble, and authorities describe the situation as chaotic. Since Thursday night, 27 people have been shot and about 30 have been arrested. Police say the trouble stemmed from a false report in which a Negro boy claimed that he had been doused with gasoline by white boys, but later admitted that he himself had been playing with lighter fluid. National Guardsmen sent in to stop civil disorders in Youngstown, Ohio, were withdrawn last night. The east side slum area of the steel town erupted into a near riot last Wednesday night when a store owner claimed maltreatment by police. The city was reported quiet as 150 of the National Guardsmen left. The nation's air traffic would come to nearly a complete halt next week if the air traffic controllers carry out their latest threat. A spokesman for their organization says 3,000 controllers, nearly half of the 7,200 working in the nation, will resign after Apollo 11 returns to Earth. Their action would be in response to a government plan to punish controllers who took part in last month's slowdown at major U.S. jet ports. The FAA announced on Friday that it had planned disciplinary action against those controllers who called in sick during the slowdown. Unless the FAA withdraws its threat, all commercial flights could be grounded. One airplane not affected by a U.S. slowdown or even a shutdown is Air Force One. It will be overseas with the president, not his coming world tour. And at least one new airport is on the plane's itinerary. ABC's George Watson reports from Bucharest. On this spot at 12.15 on Saturday, August 2nd, President Nixon is going to arrive, the first time an American president has visited a communist country in 25 years. The only problem is the airport hasn't really been built yet. The old Bucharest airport is not big enough for the big jets, so about three years ago, construction started here on a modern new jet port. It was due to be finished in 1971. But then President Nixon's trip was announced, and on top of that, the Romanian Communist Party is holding its Congress next month. So, work was speeded up, and right now there are 2,000 Romanians working around the clock to finish the job, or at least to make it presentable for the President. Even the troops have been called out. Battalions of Romanian soldiers are attacking the construction chores. They can't possibly finish the whole job by August 2nd, so they are concentrating on completing a VIP lounge. Romania claims to be building a classless communist society, but it's not apparent here. At least some travelers will be more equal than others. After Comrade Ceausescu greets Mr. Nixon, they will go into this room. When it's finished, it will boast marble floors, velvet walls, and crystal chandeliers, fit for a king, even a president. At least that's the plan. The optimistic officials in charge of this project confidently predict that everything will be ready and waiting when President Ceausescu meets President Nixon. That's 12.15 on Saturday, August 2nd. This is George Watson, ABC News, Bucharest. That is the non-space news, as some distinguished writer called it. The Earth news, anyway. Thomas? Peter, uh, generally, of course, everyone is uh, claiming to the heavens this uh, space feat, but naturally you can't please all the people all the time. And at Meridian, Connecticut, a man called the newspaper there, the morning record, complained that he had looked all over his re uh, radio and his television dial, and he couldn't find a single baseball game. All he could find was something about men going to the moon, and he thought it was just a lot of nonsense. <laughs> Fortunately, not many people think that must way. must have been a Mets fan. <laughs> <laughs> it's very tempting, of course, to speculate about going beyond the moon, uh, further into space. The flight of Apollo 11, like earlier experiments, uh, can certainly lead to more important developments very close to home, other than going deeper into space. The supposedly hostile environment of space has certain unexpected uses, which scientists hope to put to work. A whole series of projects on this order is now being worked out, generally referred to as the orbiting space stations. This was the subject of the program in the ABC television series Discovery, with Bill Owens reporting. Let's look at that now. Where do we go after the moon? One of the suggestions for the future is to have a self-contained orbiting space station that could be sent aloft and positioned anywhere we wanted it. Here's a model of a proposed space station that could fit into the same Saturn rocket that carries the Apollo spacecraft. After being placed into orbit and separated from the rocket, 
the arms of the station would automatically unfold and lock together in the shape of a wheel. Fully extended, it would be 150 feet in diameter. Small rocket motors would impart enough spin to give the station an artificial gravity. Such a station would serve as a manned laboratory performing experiments and scientific observations impossible from an Earth base. It could serve as a docking station for refueling and maintenance of other spacecraft and a command and control center for more distant voyages, like a trip to Mars or Venus. Cryogenics, I am assured by those in a position to know, is a science which is very vital to the Apollo space program. We have in our studio a couple of gentlemen who are qualified to talk at length about cryogenics. First of all, our commentator is Don Blake, and uh, or rather our demonstrator is Don Blake, and this is Edward McChandless, who will be our commentator on the question of... Uh, would you pronounce it for us and tell us what it is to begin for those uh, still struggling for the first cup of coffee this morning, gentlemen? Yes, I would say that uh, cryogenics is the science of cold, and the uh, science of cold has been used to produce these cryogenic fluids, which Don is going to demonstrate in some rather simple experiments. Uh, this particular flask contains liquid nitrogen, which is the principal constituent of the air, as you know. Uh, this material in its cryogenic form is very much like water, as you can see. I should say more accurately, it's like boiling water. But it, has, it uh, is at a very low temperature, uh, about 320 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. At these uh, very low temperatures, uh, things really happen to materials. Don has dipped a carnation in liquid nitrogen, and you can see that something very unexpected happened. Uh, this uh, phenomena of the change of physical properties of materials as they are refrigerated to the very low temperatures that exist in space, and which uh, exist, of course, in the cryogenic fluids in the Saturn vehicle, uh, presents a great materials problems. And the question of getting materials that will stand up under cold uh, and satisfactorily handle the cryogenic fluids has been a very important one, but has been well uh, solved. Just to give you an idea of what uh, these problems are, Don is forcing liquid nitrogen from the flask through a piece of ordinary rubber tubing. Uh, the tubing dips down into the liquid nitrogen. As it goes through, it freezes the tubing uh, and produces a very brittle material out of what is ordinarily considered to be a very soft, pliable material. Uh, Don will further demonstrate this by dipping a piece of, uh, again, ordinary gum tubing into liquid nitrogen. And Don, if you may be able to break that. Again, it doesn't sound much like uh, uh, rubber tubing as we know it. Uh, there, are, uh, there is a second very important cryogenic uh, fluid aboard the Saturn vehicle, and that is liquid hydrogen. Uh, whereas liquid nitrogen is very convenient to demonstrate in the studio, we of course wouldn't do this with liquid hydrogen. Uh, liquid hydrogen, again, looks very much like liquid nitrogen, but it has two important differences. First of all, it is a very energetic fuel. It possesses about three times the chemical energy content of gasoline when burned and for that reason is a very desirable space fuel. But it has a further disadvantage that it is very bulky, uh, whereas this liquid nitrogen and also liquid ni oxygen, which are used as the, uh, uh, whereas, uh, like liquid oxygen, which is the oxidizer on the Saturn booster stages, uh, liquid hydrogen is very, very uh, bulky, uh, having a density of only about a 15th of that of water or liquid uh, oxygen. And as you notice in the Saturn vehicle, the liquid hydrogen tanks are very, very bulky. Another effect that uh, cryogenics or very low temperatures has on gases is to shrink them. And Don has blown up some balloons with his own breath. And when he puts them in liquid <coughs> nitrogen, the gases shrink, shrink down, and finally liquefy because air will liquefy at liquid nitrogen temperatures. Now, when the balloon begins to pick up heat from the atmosphere here in the studio, the gas is warmed, and it produces just about the same 
volume as it had in the first place, and these balloons will return to their original condition. Don may have a little bit of a trouble getting that uh, out of his pockets. Mr. McChampus. Yes. Uh, <laughs> main, uh, the main uh, uh, purpose for this, then, is in, uh, in the development of uh, rocket fuels, as I understand it. Yes, uh, because cryogenic fluids are compact, it turns out that the cryogenic liquid form of oxygen and hydrogen are the, is the only way in which the required quantities of these gases can be put aboard a Saturn vehicle. If we had to take them on the Saturn vehicle in the heavy steel tanks that you see in garages and hospitals, uh, you would find that the Saturn vehicle is thousands of tons overweight and of course would never fly. Don is showing here that uh, as the uh, uh, gases boil off, as you see it boiling in this flask, uh, there is a great expansion going on and uh, the gas will create pressure. This again is a problem that has to be handled in the design of the space vehicle. But again, satisfactory techniques have been worked out and uh, cryogenic fluids have become, uh, you might say, the workhorse of the Saturn program. Peter, the moon, of course, has always delighted and fascinated mankind since almost the first night uh, man saw it and he has coveted it. It has stirred the imagination of many people and all types of speculation about what it is and who lives on it. ABC's correspondent Bill Butel in London talked to one of Britain's knowledgeable experts on astronomy and on space, the popular commentator Patrick Moore. Butel asked Moore, why have men always wanted the moon? Well, I think, you know, that as soon as men realized that the moon really is another world, it was logical to talk about going there. But uh, when we go back 2,000 years, this is Lucian of Samosata, the first science fiction writer in history. Uh, well, it wasn't really science as we know it. Uh, he had an idea, which he wrote forward in his book called The True History. And he called it The True History because, in his own words, it was made up of nothing but lies from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. And in this book, he had a party of sailors going through the Pillars of Hercules, uh, the things we now call the Straits of Gibraltar, and their ship was caught up in a water spout and hurled upwards so violently that it kept on keeping on for seven days and seven nights until it finally landed on the moon. And that was his method of space travel. And uh, when they got there, the sailors found it arrived at a fascinating time because the king of the moon was about to have a war against the king of the sun with regard to who should have first rights on Venus, uh, the planet, not the goddess. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, the very idea, the very conception of, of what the moon was uh, was interesting in the early days of man's history, wasn't it? Yes, well, Plutarch had the right idea there a very long time ago. And he said that the moon is earthy with mountains and ravines. And, of course, he was perfectly right on this. And really, his idea of the moon isn't so very different from our modern idea. Mm -hmm. Now, he said it was earthy. You mean like the earth? Well, he thought Dirt it was more so like on? the earth than it actually is. The whole point is, surely, that the great difference between the moon and the earth is that the moon has, to all intents and purposes, no atmosphere. And mm -hmm. if you have no atmosphere, you can't have life as we know it. And this, of course, is a thing that the old people just didn't realize and had no real means of finding out. This mm -hmm. is a fairly modern development, dating back only a few centuries. Now, who was it who said that the moon seemed to him to be uh, in the diameter of something like a foot? Oh, this goes back to the old Greeks, right on the very early days. Mind you, there are some people who still believe that. There's still an international <laughs> flat Earth society, and they believe that the moon is only a few feet in diameter and shaped rather like a saucepan. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, th this, was, this was one of the first uh, attempts to understand the moon, wasn't it? At I least suppose, in recorded history. Yes, history. I suppose it was. But after all, you couldn't really find out a great deal about the moon until telescopes came along. And that was in the very early part of the 17th century. And as soon as you got telescopes, then, of course, you could start to find out something about the moon's actual nature. Mm -hmm. And we had science fiction stories then, too. There was one in the early part of the 17th century written by an English bishop, Godwin. Yes. And this is a fascinating story because in his, uh, in his novel, uh, the hero, Domingo Gonzalez, is marooned on a desert island and yeah. he makes up his mind to escape. And the only way he can think of doing it is to build a raft and then teach ganzers or wild geese to tow him through the air. <laughs> and this was duly going on one day and he was being towed through the air on this raft when he suddenly made the entertaining discovery that the ganzers hibernated on the moon and were very busy going there taking him with them. Yes, this was the, this was the picture of the, the ganzers taking him, wasn't it? The ganzers it? taking Domingo Gonzalez to the moon. A very nice idea, but I didn't think it's going to work. Well, who was it who first began to, to uh, talk about the moon in anything like... Uh, realistic modern terms. Was it Galileo or Copernicus? 
Uh, not Copernicus, certainly. He was in the pre-telescopic era. No, I think we must say uh, Galileo, although in fact, you know, the very first moon map wasn't drawn by Galileo at all. It was drawn by an Englishman, Harriot, who was tutor to Sir Walter Raleigh at one stage. And he produced a telescopic map of the moon before Galileo did. But certainly, so far as sheer concentrated observation and interpretation goes, in those very early days of telescopic research, Galileo stands alone. Well, I was fascinated by some of the ways that people in their fantasy uh, talked about going to the moon. What was the story of the man who, who was going to... Uh, Cyrano de Bergerac it was, wasn't it? Who was going to strap dew bottles uh, <laughs> to his body? This was a lovely idea. He had a very nice means of space travel. He worked it out like this. Uh, if you go out in the early morning and look at the grass, you will see that it's covered with dew. Well, if you go out a few hours later, when the sun has risen, you will find that the dew has disappeared, and so presumably the sun has sucked it up. So according to Serrano, if you want to go into space in one easy lesson, all you need do is to collect a lot of bottles, fill them with dew, fasten them around yourself upside down, stand out in the morning, and let the sun do the rest. <laughs> and up you'd go. Well, I haven't tried this myself. I think I'd need an awful lot of dew. Yes, well, I, what I'm interested in, too, one of, one of the things that, that fascinates me, because I really am a layman when it, talks, when it comes to talking about going to the moon or, or really when it, talks, it comes to talking about uh, space or anything of the sort, I'm fascinated by the uh, accuracy, the, the almost uh, the primitive accuracy that some of the uh, early scientists or maybe even just quasi-scientists uh, uh, came up with in their, their ideas about the moon. Well, of course, the first real scientific novelist of what we can call the modern era was, I suppose, Jules Verne mm -hmm. and his famous book, From the Earth to the Moon, which came out in 1865. And he wasn't a scientist himself, but he knew plenty of people who were, and he got his facts right as far as he could. But, of course, he did make one fundamental mistake. Uh, his method of propulsion to send a projectile from the Earth to the Moon was by means of a bullet fired out of a space gun. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, just isn't going to work. I mean, there are two good, very good reasons why it won't. Uh, first of all, uh, air sets up resistance, and mm -hmm. resistance causes heat. And if you fire a bullet through the lower atmosphere at a speed of seven miles a second, which is the speed you've got to go if you're going to break free from the Earth, well, you're going to set up so much heat by friction that you're going to turn into a puff of smoke. Mm -hmm. So that's one reason why the space gun doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And, of course, there's the extra point that even if you forget that one, if you forget about air resistance entirely, and just imagine that you sit yourself inside a space bullet and then get yourself fired up at seven miles a second, escape velocity, well, it's going to be quite a jerk, isn't it? Yes. And I think that anyone who tried that, well, might, I suppose, get to the moon, but would certainly get there in the form of fine jelly spread about inside his projectile. Yes, well, Jules Verne, uh, admittedly, and, and in your book you point out that his, his theories were all wrong, except there is a very interesting picture that you have in your book. It shows the, the landing uh, in uh, Jules' book, in Jules Verne's book, the landing of the uh, space capsule that he had there, a projectile landing in the middle of the ocean, and here it is with an American flag on it. It, and uh, 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 some people in a whale boat are uh, circling around and, and looks for all the world very much like the, the, the space capsule that we pick up in the Pacific or the Atlantic Ocean, doesn't it? Well, there was a great deal that Jules Verne did get right. I think the only thing he really got wrong was his basic method of propulsion. If he'd used rockets instead of the space gun, he would have been uncannily accurate. Mm -hmm. After all, he even got as far as suggesting building a 120-inch telescope on Long Peak especially to observe this space shot. Mm -hmm. And after all, that's not so very different from the, from the Palomar telescope of today. And he even got his landing site right. Yes. Because his Stones Hill is not so very far from Cape Kennedy. And yes. his, his launching, his launching yes. site, you mean? Yes, his launching site. Yes. And his, um, uh, his splash down the area was right, too. Now, I think if you forget the fact that he used the wrong method of propulsion and he got some facts wrong about weightlessness, if you forget those two, he was uncannily accurate. For any of you living in New York City, um, yesterday, you will probably have had the opportunity to see one of a dozen or so space movies that were run in their entirety, fairly modern space movies, uh, made in the 1950s. Um, and every station, I suspect, across the country that has had some kind of old television library that has a space movie in it has had a chance to run it. Um, I had a pretty good opportunity the other day to spend some time with Dick Schickel, who is the film critic from Life magazine, and Dick hired me away to uh, a screening room, and we looked at a great mass of material uh, of films that have been made about space since really around the turn of the century. It's well known, uh, for example, that Germany uh, was an early starter in the art of rocketry, but perhaps less well known is the fact that they were also one of the first countries, they one of the first peoples, to start making movies about space. And Dick Schickel and I sat and looked in this particular segment at a very interesting picture that was made in Germany, and Dick will explain it 
uh, in somewhat greater detail. Burdened as we have been by technical detail over the last few days, Dick Schickel and I have been sneaking off to screening rooms to look at old movies about what people in earlier periods thought about what was going to happen today. Uh, we're going to show you a film now, which is a 1929 German film uh, called Woman in the Moon. What's interesting about this film, as Dick will expand on, is it's a really very serious attempt to picture what it might be like if man went to the moon. Uh, it's technical, they had technical advisors in those days, <laughs> it's very amusing, uh, was T.K. Obert, Hermann Obert, who later became, he was a great German rocketry expert, and he later became uh, Werner von Braun's teacher. So technically, uh, 1929, it has a specific look to it. Um, dramatically, how about that? Dramatically, <laughs> it's pretty absurd, I think. But it was directed by the great Fritz Lang, and most people remember him for M, which uh, made Peter Lorre a star, and was probably the first realistic film about a criminal psychopath and a you know, landmark in film history. But The Woman in the Moon was really closer to the main line of Lang's interests and, and the German industry at that time. Uh, they were very hung up on fables and nightmares and uh, fantasy, and uh, he was a great explorer of these kind of weird visions. So, uh, though most of the people on this voyage couldn't pass the psychological tests at, at NASA, uh, I think the important thing he's driving at is this is a fable, a parable, about man's greed, really. Now, this is a scientist who was obsessed with the notion that there's gold in those lunar hills. Potential backers? No, these are scientists he's explaining the idea to, and uh, like all great ideas, it's scoffed at and scorned. Of course, scientists have never been as obsessed with gold as backers have. Now, this, this is a backers audition. It's 30 years later. And the old man's been very mad, but his uh, cause has been taken up by uh, younger people. And it's a mock-up of their rocket ship. You pointed out once before, Dick, it, it's really worth noting here that space adventure and going to the moon or Mars in those days, the moon in this case, was a private venture rather than the government. That's right. Uh, nobody thought governments had enough imagination to do it. Uh, they were depending on uh, private capital. probably recall when the Saturn V went up this time, there was enormous water to cool the pad down. And in these days, they saw water as a means by which to launch the rocket out of it. Well, to keep it upright until they could get it more. They were pretty good crowds for space shoots even then. And the first countdown. You can see it's a kind of a mixed crew there. understood that it was going to take two stages at least to get to the moon. 
little trouble igniting the second one. That's right, he's having his problems there. Again, because you see, he has to do it mechanically. Stage separation. Ah, fantastic. And now here's a kind of a nice uh, solution to the problem of weightlessness, uh, which will be familiar to any subway rider. And uh, apparently on this trip, Woman in the Moon, we had a stowaway. That's right. No good film without a stowaway. He came on carrying science fiction magazines to read on the trip. that made this, which was the Ufa studio in Berlin, was really the most, probably technically the most advanced movie studio in the world. They were really marvelous special effects people there. Dick is where Herman Obert's technical advice goes out the window altogether. Pretty much, yeah. Um... They're in the moon gravity now. They, they brought along that uh, scientist we saw at the beginning there. Uh... Now there's uh, Obert predicting uh, moon, moon dust. dust. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't even see the capsule. It's buried so deeply in it. This is our gold-obsessed old party here. What you should be watching for here, by the way, are a couple of contradictions. Look first at the match. There is no atmosphere on the moon as we know it, and yet our scientist discovers it. And yeah, you can even do that with a match on the Earth, you know. <laughs> and secondly, look at the boots, which are terribly similar to what are worn today. rod with which they hope to look for water, but he's going to use it to work out his obsession, which is this gold. It was pointed out by a scientist just the other day that if there is gold on the moon, the cost of going and getting it and bringing it back would make it so many times its Earth value that it wouldn't be worth it. But it's amazing in that film to see the, the, the combination of accuracy and poetics. That's true. And I think the most important thing to remember about these movies is that uh, they are visionary. They do speak to our most uh, attractive quality, I think, which is uh, man the visionary. And I, th I think that's what's most important about them, not whether they're technically accurate or not. It's, it's unlikely that's going to play in your neighborhood in the, in the next little while, but it is called Woman in the Moon if it ever comes around. Thanks again, Dick Schickle from Life. Thank you, Pete. Good morning. I'm ABC Science Editor Jules Bergman, and with me is ABC White House Correspondent Tom Jarrell. Apollo 11 is now 14,000 miles out from Earth, speeding homeward at 11,000 miles an hour to end its epic eight-day lunar flight. It's headed toward a landing 950 miles southwest of Hawaii. The weather, good generally, but windy, up to 21 miles an hour, with seas running to six feet. Astronauts Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Mike Collins may be a bit uncomfortable in that rolling sea state while they're waiting for the helicopters to pick them up and take them to the prime recovery vessel, the aircraft carrier Hornet, 
now standing by in the recovery area after having moved that recovery area and the ships 215 miles northwestward during the night to avoid thunderstorms and high seas. It's going to be a most unusual recovery, one complete with the President of the United States. And to give us that story, Tom. Jules, the President is now on the communication ship Arlington. He'll be flying by chopper shortly to the deck of the Hornet. There, he will become the first chief executive to personally be on hand to welcome astronauts back from outer space and be involved in a small footnote to history, something the president so frequently likes to refer to. The president will be using this successful Apollo mission as a springboard for an Earth orbital trip of his own. After splashdown today, he will begin a 10-day goodwill trip that will take him through five South Asian countries, a brief journey behind the Iron Curtain to visit with leaders of Romania, then a stop in England for an airport conference with Prime Minister Wilson, returning to Washington Sunday, August 3rd. By traveling in the wake of the Apollo 11 success, the President is assured of being abroad at a time when United States prestige will be extremely high, possibly at an all-time high for recent years. It's a very nice asset when you're on such a diplomatic journey. By the way, the President was a naval officer during World War II, but last night on the Arlington was the first time that he had ever spent the night on a Navy ship. Of course, the major attention today is not on the president, but on the astronauts. How are they doing, Jules? Tom, they're doing just fine. They have the spacecraft configured for the re-entry. They sound uh, relaxed and rested this morning and ready to come home after that epic eight-day lunar flight. Now, here's what happens this morning, beginning about 55 minutes from now. The spacecraft soars in over the southern hemisphere and then plunges west to east over Australia until it finally hits the splashdown area and comes down to a good landing 950 miles southwest of Hawaii. We'll give you another idea of that now. That's the way our telestrator can do dotted lines. Now we're going to show you what happens as a spacecraft encounters the Earth's atmosphere. You remember the Earth's atmosphere is a belt that extends for about 400,000 feet over the Earth like that. The spacecraft has to fly in precisely at a 6.5 degree flight path angle, rather like that. And here are the dangers involved in this procedure. If the spacecraft re-enters too steeply, it'll plunge into the atmosphere, burn up and break up, and the astronauts would be lost. On the other hand, if the, the command module computer or the astronauts fly too shallow a re-entry angle, they would skip off the atmosphere like that and go out 10 or 20,000 miles, and they'd run out of oxygen and batteries and also be in trouble. What we're shooting for, to show you again, what Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins will be doing with their computer guiding them is to fly back in at the 6.5 degree re-entry angle, or flight path angle, we should say, which will carry them back in like that and like that in a gentle looping maneuver until they finally come to a landing 950 miles southwest of Hawaii like that. And now we'll show you the actual re-entry corridor over the Earth with this map. Here's Australia. Here's Australia here in the southwest. There's Hawaii up here, the upper end of our quadrant. The spacecraft comes in, flying west to east over Australia, loops up gently like that, and finally loops forward to come to a landing right here. We're a little bit uh, east of our target. Let's try that again. We ran a wild with ourselves there. West to east over Australia, comes into a looping landing like here, about 950 miles south of Hawaii. The interesting thing that happened in the last eight or nine hours is that due to the bad weather, the re-entry area was moved. The entire task force, the recovery carrier Hornet, the communication ship Arlington, aboard which, above which President uh, Nixon is presently on, and the escorting destroyers steamed at flank speed some 215 miles north from their old position, which was relatively like that. That was the original splashdown area. They steam 215 miles north to a new splashdown position there to get calmer seas and less winds and better re-entry and recovery weather for the astronauts. We'll give you an idea of what happens here during the actual re-entry process. Apollo uh, is protected, of course, by, by a heat shield. This is an idea of what it looks like. It's a aluminum honeycomb with phenolic resin that's actually injected into it. The heat shield varies in thickness from one and a half inches, as it is here, down to about five and eighth, five eighths of an inch. The thicker portions, of course, are where the heat is most intense, where the astronauts face heats of up to 5,000 degrees. And it's a heat shield that works darn effectively. We're going to show you how effectively right now. As we turn on this trusty blowtorch and hope we don't blow ourselves up. And this is a little bit of, of what happens during the reentry process. 
As some of you may remember, during the Apollo 10 re-entry, that flaming fireball over the Pacific, as seen from the recovery carrier, this is what the sailors below and television viewers were actually seeing. It was the heat shield charring and ablating during the 25,000 mile an hour re-entry speeds as the heat shield heated up to 5,000 degrees. And there you can see the way the phenolic resin is injected into the honeycomb slots here. The heat shield material actually chars and ablates away, producing a radiator effect. The burning away of the material keeps the astronauts inside the spacecraft at a cool, comfortable 75 degrees. If there were no heat shield, it would be a bad day indeed. They'd be singed terribly by the heat. It would be impossibly hot inside the cockpit. The heat shield glows green, red, and white during the reentry process. Our torch reaches only about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You can imagine what it's like at the 5,000 degree reentry speed. Soaring back in at speed, reaching 25,000 miles an hour. Apollo control for late word. System is go aboard the spacecraft. That word was communication system is go aboard the spacecraft for reentry. Apollo 11 Houston, we see you getting ready for set. Uh, everything looks mighty fine down here. Same here, Ryan. Thank you. Step, separation of the command module and service module 15 minutes before re-entry 2,000 miles out from Earth. Separation takes place, the astronauts will uh, cant the spacecraft around a bit so that when they use their little reaction control thrusters to pull away from the service module, uh, it's harmlessly out of their way. And the, I think the apprehension, Tom, in mission control is readily apparent now, though they're hearing good radio signal from Apollo 11 via the Australian tracking stations. Uh, part of the fun of the mission for them, part of the uh, History and the climax of it is seeing it on television, uh, live, as it were, courtesy of uh, television, and seeing the actual re-entry, if we're lucky, and the splashdown and the recovery of the astronauts. Well, now, sir, here's, here's separation, as we'll see in about uh, a few minutes from now. It should take place with the spacecraft. The service module pulls away on its own. Then the command module is tilted down toward the <coughs> Earth's atmosphere. That actually happens automatically with one of the uh, CMC or the Command Module Computer Programs taking over the astronauts back it up manually. We're awaiting confirmation of separation. Jack Riley and Apollo Control, separation should have taken place. Well, we confirm separation now from uh, on the ground readings from telemetry. We can confirm separation. That's one of the three critical parts of the re-entry process. The service module is now safely away from Apollo 11. Now it's tilted down, as we see in our animation, to face the searing re-entry heat. This Dur during a conversation this morning earlier between Mission Control and Mike Collins and Apollo 11, Mission Control assured uh, the astronauts that the carrier Hornet is on station just far enough, uh, far enough off the target point to keep from being hit. <laughs> they feel very confident about this. Well, if, um, if Apollo 11 is as accurate in its aiming point as Apollo 10 and 8 were, it should be very close. Uh, they landed almost, almost too close. Apollo 11 Houston, uh, you're still looking mighty fine here. Uh, you're cleared for landing. Capcom, Ron. Yeah, we appreciate that, Ron. Thanks. Right, secure, stand and lock. Roger. For a pilot, that must be a terribly reassuring phrase. You are cleared for landing after coming back from the moon. And at this point, both speeds and heats on the spacecraft are beginning to build up. 800 nautical miles high. Velocity, 33,000 feet per second. They're around seven minutes away from reaching 400,000 feet above the Earth, the really critical point of this re-entry, where they encounter maximum speeds and maximum aerodynamic forces 
and heating effect. Guidance reports Apollo 11 right down the middle of the corridor. Seven minutes away from entry. And from all those signs, it looks like Apollo 11 will be a record-setting closeness, have a record-setting closeness to the Hornet. The actual landing zone, Apollo 11 handy, heading for about 950 miles southwest of Hawaii. Where the Hornet, a 38,000 ton carrier, a tired veteran of World War II, built in 1942, is standing by on station to pick them up. Uh, our space down here is our latitude longitude, 1330, 169. This is Neil Armstrong talking directly to the Hornets flag plot room, telling exactly where he's going to land, a most unusual event. And they are very close to being on the money. We're trying to plot the coordinates Neil was reading off his computer on our uh, one of our charts here. But it looks quite close to the nominal landing area. Hornet does. report spacecraft right on target point. Now about 58 seconds away from landing. Apollo 11 descending through about descending through clouds at about 2,000 feet. That's Neil Armstrong giving the position reports. President, of course, watching from his vantage point, some five decks up on the carrier, standing there with the various VIPs. The men on the Hornet, some 2,200 of them, the crew, they were up as early as 2 o'clock this morning, getting everything ship shape. Final preparations for the President, Secretary of State Rogers, Admiral McCain, commander of all the U.S. forces in the Pacific, all here to observe this historic moment. getting word from the swim helicopters, the rescue helicopters, that the crew is in excellent condition. Let's go to them now and see if we can pick up some direct radio communication. The ship is uh, two and a quarter miles from the spacecraft now, and the spacecraft uh, pretty clear now in the picture. The uh, big swimmer, Lieutenant Hattelberg, is using hand signals to uh, communicate with the uh, astronauts inside their spacecraft. He does have a little plastic board with him and a grease pencil, which he can write on and flash messages to them that way. Actually, Ron, not much communication is needed between the astronauts. The hatch is now open. We have word uh, from the scene from the recovery helicopter. And the first astronaut is coming out. That would be Buzz Aldrin, wouldn't it, uh, Nellis? I believe so, yes. Band on the deck strikes up. Let's listen to that band, as they say. President's applauding as they play Columbia, the gem of the ocean. Columbia, of course, is uh, that module out there. There goes the first.
first astronaut. Up in the Billy Funet. Up in the Billy Funet. Forty feet from the sea to the helicopter door. They have instructions in the helicopter, the two crew members in back, uh, not to touch the astronaut. Dr. Carpentier will uh, will help the astronaut out of his uh, net. We understand that President Nixon requested that the band play Columbia Jack the Ocean. Written on the bottom of the helicopter is another welcome aboard for the astronauts. It says, Hail Columbia. The other night that helicopter was uh, on the deck and I peeked underneath and they had the old sign from the Apollo 10 uh, recovery saying, hello there, Charlie Brown. But at the last minute they painted the new welcome on saying, hail Columbia. So when the astronaut rides up in the net and looks up, he sees it painted on the bottom of helicopter 66. Here goes the second astronaut up in the net. Down here on the high. John Hirosaki, the NASA project engineer uh, who had a lot to do with developing the mobile quarantine facility, has been spending most of his time the last five days inside it, along with Dr. Carpentier. And uh, John Hirosaki is a busy man right now. He's making his very, very final preparations uh, in these final minutes before the astronauts come on board the Hornet. It's been about an hour exactly, Dallas, in splashdown, and one more astronaut to go. So uh, it looks like uh, they've uh, beaten the timetable by about uh, 18 or 19 minutes and uh, are just about uh, doing it in exactly the same time it took during the dress rehearsal the other day. And considering that the spacecraft came down fairly far from the ship, the seas are a bit rough today and they had to go through the decontamination process, that's pretty good time. I'd say it's excellent time. Uh, you know, actually, Ron, I think that they didn't spend as much time on decontamination as they have in some of the uh, simulated recoveries we've watched. It seemed to me it went very fast. We're waiting now for the third and last astronaut to be pulled up to the helicopter. Then they'll come aboard. There won't be that flight deck welcome ceremony with the red carpet. There he goes. Last astronaut going up. There won't be the flight deck welcome ceremony because uh, they've got to go right into quarantine. However, Ron, there will be a ceremony down here on the hangar deck. Uh, the, Marine, uh, the Marines will present military honors. The Navy band uh, will move down here from the flight deck where it is right now. The president uh, will be appearing uh, very soon after the astronauts finish their initial medical uh, inspection so that the uh, routine flight deck ceremony, which has become so familiar over the past few years, will actually be supplanted by something a good deal more spectacular down here on the hangar deck. After all, uh, it, this is the first time in history that the President of the United States has been on board the recovery carrier to greet the returning astronauts. The President has a uh, overhang on that uh, bridge, so he's not getting wet. We believe the president may have moved off the bridge, possibly on his way down. It's only a very short trip. Oh, there he is. He's moved aft, and he's back to the Admiral's Bridge, uh, just outside uh, Flag Plot. Six coming in. Land by elevator two for its descent. No baseball caps this time and no handshakes. These astronauts headed for weeks of isolation. Helicopter 66 down to the hangar deck 
where the mobile quarantine facility awaits astronauts Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Mike Collins. And let's get uh, the report from the hangar deck now. Big moment. Number three elevator on the port side is still in the raised position. No, it's down now. Down now. I couldn't see from my point. It's now down, and uh, the tractor is being moved back to uh, haul the helicopter off the number two elevator and back here to uh, its position alongside the mobile quarantine facility. Band still playing joyously up on the flight deck. President Nixon is still on the flag bridge. We expect he'll be coming down soon. Here comes the number 66 being hauled inboard from number two elevator very slowly by the tractor. The procedure is for the tractor to uh, pull it straight across the ships and it will then be uh, backed by the uh, tractor. So it's being pulled now with the nose forward in order to move it around in the correct position. There it goes. Now the uh, tail of uh, number 66 is pointing aft along the hangar deck. Astronaut still inside, holding the uh, tail back. Lavalier microphones are around their necks, and uh, anything they say will be uh, carried by loudspeaker. Large numbers of sailors behind the lines uh, standing there, uh, waiting to watch this historic moment, the first appearance of the astronauts uh, before any, uh, anybody but the swimmers and the uh, crew of number 66 elephant. Dr. Don, Dr. Don Stalton, walking along the uh, blue path, is the chief of the NASA recovery team on board, talking now with John Stonecipher, the assistant chief. Helicopter being moved slowly back here with the flight crew, the flight deck crew uh, in yellow jerseys. Man up the head about to blow the whistle for it to stop. The hatch is just about in position. A few more feet. There it goes. That's it. Dr. Stalkin, Dr. Stone Cipher personally move that the flight of wooden steps up to the uh, hatch on the uh, starboard side of the uh, helicopter. Dr. Carpentier slides it open, and here they come. Here they come, the three astronauts, Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins, waving to the uh, crowd of cheering sailors, moving swiftly into the mobile quarantine facility. There's a wild scene of exultation and joy and mission control as the, they saw, even as you did, astronauts Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins emerge in good shape from Helicopter 66 to enter the mobile quarantine facility. The pent-up emotions of eight years of work to achieve this moment are overflowing. Jules that. Dallas Townsend is now uh, talking just, uh, to the helicopter pilot, the, uh, the man who was flying uh, number 66 when they picked him up. Let's it was a real team effort, as you know. A lot of people uh, supported us up to the minute of pickup, and uh, it went very, very well. Uh, what was your total time, Don? Gee, I'd have to look at the log sheet, Dallas. I don't know, but I, I feel we're about five or six minutes ahead of our uh, schedule. It just, uh, it just couldn't have gone uh, more smoothly. Chief, Rob, or Chief uh, Wood here did a magnificent job, and Chief Rob Ned, who is still locked up in the airplane, yeah. also did well. Chief Wood, uh, did you have a chance to say anything to the astronauts? Did, you, did they say anything to you? No, sir. With the uh, bigs on, they, they couldn't have heard me, and with the headset we were had on, I couldn't hear anything they said. They, their actions indicated they were uh, cheerful uh, all the way through the entire procedure. 
Was there any sort of message that they conveyed in some way or other to you? No, sir. We didn't. We didn't really have time. We were too busy trying to get our gear together to uh, get back on board. Yeah. Uh, Lieutenant Johnson, uh, you probably got a look at them. Uh, you were flying co-pilot. Yes, I was. Uh, I looked back as we got out of the helicopter, and one of them gave me a thumbs up. And that's the only signal I got from them. They sure looked cheerful, though. Glad to get back. Boy, it's a big thrill for me to pick them up, too. Let's. Uh go outside Mission Control now, where ABC's Jim Kincaid is standing by with Lunar Module Pilot Gene Cernan from Apollo 10. How about it? Pretty great. Just outstandingly beautiful. It's just unbelievable, but real. Now, you're not entirely unfamiliar with moon flights, so I wonder if there's anything you saw on this one that, uh, that really, really surprised you. No, uh, I, I think uh, I sort of lived the flight with these uh, with these guys uh, through television. I felt like I was in a spacecraft, and uh, having been there, I knew what they were thinking uh, when they were going through. Except, of course, those last uh, last few minutes. And uh, here's another man who's been there, Bill Anders. Bill Anders, I talked to you just the other day, Bill. Uh, what's your first comment? I think it was mighty uh, beautiful flight. Really you know, impressed. it's it's uh, it's more than just an exciting achievement. I, I think it's a it's a real reward and it's a, a real accomplishment of the entire 200 million people in this country. Uh, a lot of people dedicated themselves, dedicated their ambitions and efforts, and it's not the people here at Mission Control. It's not the uh, the three guys who flew it. Uh, it's the culmination of uh, really the the sincere efforts of so many many million Americans, and I think they've got a right to be proud, and I know they all are proud. Now let's go back to the Hornet. And there's uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger, the president's security aide, Tom. Yes, and Secretary of State uh, William Rogers in the and foreground. And Frank Borman in the background. And so the president obviously must be expected momentarily. And this is a scene we're familiar with, yes. Just before he arrives, usually his aides uh, come first. Bob Halderman, the man with the uh, brush haircut, uh, standing behind Dr. Kissinger. Yes, Secretary of State Rogers chatting with Someone in the foreground looks like one of the technicians. Here comes the president now, Tom. Uh, through the hatch to the hangar deck. Robert Flores. Nixon waving to the astronauts. The curtains have been drawn. And there they are in the rear, rear window. The president signaling for applause from the crowd. Astronauts gather in the window. Neil, Buzz, and Mike, I want you to know that I think I'm the luckiest man in the world. And I say this not only because I have the honor to be President of the United States, but particularly because I have the privilege of uh, speaking for so many and welcoming you back to Earth. Uh, I can tell you about all the messages we've received in Washington. Over 100 foreign governments, emperors and presidents and prime ministers and kings have sent the most warm messages that we've ever received. They represent over two billion people on this earth, all of them who have had the opportunity through television to see what you have done. And then I also bring you messages from members of the cabinet and members of the Senate and members of the House and the Space Agency, from the streets of San Francisco where people stopped me a few days ago and you all love that city, I know as I do. But most important, I had a telephone call yesterday the toll wasn't, incidentally, as great as the one I made to you fellows on the moon. <laughs> I made that collect, incidentally, in case you didn't know. <laughs> but I called uh, three of, in my view, three of the greatest ladies and most courageous ladies in the whole world today, your wives. 
and from Jan and Joan and Pat. I bring their love and their congratulations. We think it's just wonderful that they could have participated at least through television in this return. We're only sorry they couldn't be here. And also, I've got to let you in a little secret. I made a date with them. Uh, I invited them to dinner on, on the 13th of uh, August, right after you come out of quarantine. It will be a state dinner held in Los Angeles. The governors of all the 50 states will be there, the ambassadors, others from around the world and in America. And uh, they told me that you would come too. And all I want to know, will you come? We want to honor you then. <laughs> I'll do anything you say, Mr. President, <laughs> anytime. Uh, one question I think that uh, all of us would like to ask, uh, uh, as we saw you bouncing around in that uh, boat out there, I wonder if that wasn't the hardest part of the journey. Was that the only, did, did any of you get seasick? No, we didn't, and it, it was uh, one of the harder parts, but it was one of the most pleasant, we can assure you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just know that, uh, uh, you can sense what we all sense. When you get back now, incidentally, have you been able to follow some of the things that happened when you've gone? Did you know about the All-Star Game? Yes, yes sir. The, uh, the capsule communicators have been giving us uh, they daily news posted. reports. Yeah. Were you American League or National League? I'm a National League man. National I'm nonpartisan, sir. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There's the politician in the group, <laughs> right. <laughs> We're sorry you missed that game. Yes. Well, oh, you knew that, too. You really yeah, we heard that. Uh, yeah, the rain. The rain. Right. Well, we haven't learned to control the weather yet, but that's something we can look forward to as tomorrow's challenge. Right, right. Well, I can only summarize it because I don't want to hold you now. You have so much more to do. And gee, you look great. You feel as good as oh, you look. Oh, you feel great. Feel just perfect, Mr. Yeah. President. Yeah. Are you? I understand your Frank Borman says you're a little younger by reason of having going into space. Is that right? Do you feel that way? A little younger? We're a lot younger than Frank Borman. <laughs> 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 there he is over there. <laughs> Come on over, Frank, so they can see you. And are you going to take that lying down? <laughs> it looks like he has aged in the last yeah. uh, couple of weeks. Come on, Frank. Mr. President, the one thing I want to, you know, we have a, a poet in Mike Collins, and he really gave me a hard time for describing you words of fantastic and beautiful. And you were, I counted them, in three minutes up there, you used four fantastics and two beautifuls. <laughs> well, just let me close off with this one thing. I, I was thinking, as, as, as you know, as you came down, and we knew it was a success, and it had only been eight days, just, just a week, a long week, that this is the greatest week in the history of the world since the creation. Because as a result of what happened in this week, the world is bigger, infinitely. And also, as I'm going to find on this trip around the world, and as Secretary Rogers will find as he covers the other countries in Asia, as a result of what you've done, the world's never been closer together before. And we just thank you for that. And I only hope that all of us in government, all of us in America, uh, that as a result of what you've done, we can do our job a little better. We can reach for the stars just as you have reached so far from the stars. We don't want to hold you any longer. Anybody have a, a last word? How about promotions? Do you think we could arrange something? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're just pleased to be back and very honored that you uh, were so kind as to come out here and uh, welcome us back. Yeah. And uh, we look, look forward to getting out of this quarantine and, and uh, Great. talking without having glass Great. between us. Bye. Yes, and uh, incidentally, the, the speeches that you have to make at this dinner can be very short. And if you want to say fantastic or beautiful, that's all right with us. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try to think of new, any new adjectives. They've all been said. And now I think, incidentally, that uh, all of us uh, who, the millions that are seeing us on television now, seeing you, uh, would feel as I do that, in a sense, our prayers have been answered. And I think it would be very appropriate if Chaplain Pirto, the chaplain of this ship, were to offer a prayer of thanksgiving. And if he would step up now, Chaplain, thank you. Let us pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, our minds are staggered and our spirits exultant with the magnitude and precision of this entire Apollo 11 mission. We have spent the past week in communal anxiety and hope 
as our astronauts sped through the glories and dangers of the heavens, as we try to understand and analyze the scope of this achievement for human life, our reason is overwhelmed with a bonding gratitude and joy, even as we realize the increasing challenges of the future. This magnificent event illustrates anew what man can accomplish when purpose is firm and intent corporate. A man on the moon was promised in this decade, and though some were unconvinced, the reality is with us this morning in the persons of astronauts Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins. We applaud their splendid exploits, and we pour out our thanksgiving for their safe return to us, to their families, to all mankind. Grant us peace, beginning in our own hearts, and a mind attuned with goodwill towards our neighbor. All this we pray as our thanksgiving rings out to thee, in the name of our Lord, amen. Amen. Jules, there in the, uh, on the lower flight deck as the president uh, went down to see the astronauts, I couldn't help but think that he reminded me very much of a very proud father who had gone to the hospital to see a newborn child and discovered that he had triplets. It was the most enthusiastic thing I've seen in some time from him. He's d discovered a new thing, Tom. Uh, he discovered it through Frank Borman, who has now become a close aide to the president who was assigned to him for this entire mission. And he's discovered, I think, that in this torn, tormented time of ours, with a country that's searching for the, to do the things it has to do, that this great thing that's been done here, this, this lunar landing, is, if anything, a unifying factor. It's a moment of national triumph and dedication. And I think he really feels it deeply, as all of us do. Jules, of course, one of the proudest places in the United States at the moment is the little Ohio town of Wapakoneta, population 7,000, and uh, the home of Neil Armstrong, where Neil first began flying. And uh, we have a picture from uh, the home, but it, this is not uh, from Wapakoneta, Ohio. This is from the home of Neil Armstrong. This looks like uh, Jan Armstrong walking up now. Here's Jan Armstrong. Representing the moon. Would you come forward, Mrs. Armstrong, please? No. How are you today? I'm fine. Have all your prayers been answered? Yes. I would like to say to the President, to the President of the United States, President Nixon, President Johnson, President Kennedy, to all of NASA, to all of the contractors that have helped to make this flight successful, to the astronaut crew, to the men, the three men who made this historic flight, and all the peoples of the world, we thank you for everything, your prayers, your thoughts, just everything. And if anyone were to ask me how I could describe this flight, I can only say that it was absolutely out of this world. So America has been to the moon and back safely and successfully. And we think perhaps in the process rediscovered itself and discovered that it can do anything it sets out to do. On the moon, to the planets, or in its own cities, in our own cities. Apollo 12 lies ahead in November with a new landing site on the moon, Site 7. A new goal and new dangers as well as new rewards. And Apollo 13, 14, and 15 next year, as well as those cities, slums, and a people who can and will do all that has to be done when they know. The moon then can be seen for what it really is, for what it truly is. And we don't need to look through telescopes, only with our naked eye, to discover that the moon is nothing more than a mirror image of the Earth and what we can do ourselves when we set out to. This is Jules Bergman at ABC Space Headquarters. Tom? Jules, of course, it was Presidents Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, all moved us along uh, supporting the space program, putting the power of the office behind the space program, uh, continuing to keep it alive and vital with the necessary funds and the necessary full commitment. Uh, President Nixon there today uh, was uh, there as the chief executive, of course, but many other presidents, those I just mentioned, of course, have had a great deal uh, to, to uh, 
contribute uh, toward this final goal of putting a man on the moon. But of course the firm commitment was that of John Kennedy back in 1961 and an address to Congress when he said we've got to be there by 1970 and we have. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. But in a very real sense, it will not be one man going to the moon. If we make this judgment affirmatively, it will be an entire nation, for all of us must work to put him there. Later tonight, Ingmar Bergman's touching biography of his parents begins on Masterpiece Theater. Containing scenes not shown in the theatrical version, The Best of Intentions premieres tonight at 9. Now stay tuned for Understanding Whitewater. To have your own complete six-hour home video collection of Apollo 11 as it happened, call 1-800-913-3434. The cost is $49.95 plus $4 for shipping and handling.